All right, here we go. It is an absolute honor to welcome Young Buck to Vlad TV for the first time. Word, bro. It's been a long time since I even been able to, not just an interview to even see you, bro. You know what I'm saying? And congratulate, congratulations first to all your accomplishments because I've watched you literally take the world over, you dig? So, salute. Thank you, man. That Salute. that means so much because me and you go back about 15 years. Every bit of it. Yep. Every bit I of remember it. I used to go down to G-Unit offices in that little uh, conference room yeah, with man. My, my video camera holding it myself. Yep. You yep. know, I think you still had the spinning the spinning piece back then. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The YB, you know, the G-Unit. Uh, you, you, you come yeah. from the core of G-Unit. You know, when we first at that time was really just even kind of like getting off the ground and moving, you captured all of those moments. So yeah, man. I did, man. I captured some of it. And, uh, you know, I was a fan back then. I'm a fan now. And uh, man, you have such an incredible story. And this is what I want to talk about today. Let's get and it. And although we've done little bits and pieces over the years, this is our first real sit down. So I want to do it right. Let's do it, so, man. So we're going to start in the very beginning. So you were born and raised in Nashville. Born and raised out here, man, uh, Cashville, Tennessee, man. You know, Nashville, Tennessee, this is my home. Uh, yeah, this is where it all started from for me. Okay, and what was Nashville like growing up during that time? Because we're talking about the 80s, early 90s. It was, it was uh, totally different from what we see today. You know, it was really, 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 I mean, it's still street orientated out here especially the environment that I come from. But, uh, you know, back in the days, man, this was like a, a landing spot for some of the greatest artists that I've seen today. You know, Tupac used to run through here. Easy e used to run through here back in his day. Bone Thugs, uh, you know, all of the hot boys. And just, this was almost like a second home for them back in those days. Uh, you know, so I kind of come from the environment where I didn't absorb the, you know, of course, country music has always been here, but uh, it's always and still is like two sides to Nashville. You know, you got this branded side that gives you, you know, the the the, the country music side that, that comes along with the city. And then you got this environment that I growed up on, on my side of the city. So I was uh, one of the first ones to bring the, the 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 whole essence of the street side of Cashville uh, to a worldwide platform. We had a lot of different other artists that, you know, at the time was really uh, making a lot of noise and, and 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 doing that thing as well. But you know, I just got blessed to become, you know, the first and only platinum selling artist from this place, rap artist anyway. You know, so it was just wild, man. It was a lot of a lot of, um, it was kind of like a mixture of LA with Nashville. We had a lot of LA influence throughout Nashville from those days back then. You know, the gang culture, it was here in, 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 a, in a very big way and still is, you know. So that part of it was um, was real interesting for me growing up because it was almost like being from the South, but then everything and the way that things interacted and rotated, it was around basically the West Coast. Like I say, you had individuals out here like Tupac used to be at the Malibu all the time. And, you know, you might have seen Easy e chilling at Dobie's Barn Grill, you know what I'm saying, with Hicks and, and stuff like that. So for me, it was, it was really a kind of odd situation seeing some of these major guys as a youngster and what they meant to the world and even to myself from music. But then being able to be right there, UGK, you know, uh, Pimp C and Bun, this was like their second home, you know, and these guys was play real hands-on positions within my career and my upbringing because, you know, I had individuals that kept me surrounded or in their presence. So, um, you know, Nashville, Cashville is basically uh, 
the breeding ground, not just for myself, but it's always played a part into, like I said, some of the biggest artists that we have this to today. Well, on, on one of your hit songs, Let Me In, you had a line on there. You said, my daddy's a dope fiend and I don't really miss him. Ain't seen him in 10 years. Uh, was that an actual fact or just a you know, fact line? Actual facts. You know, my daddy's a dope fiend and I don't really miss him. Ain't seen him in 10 years. The nigga's still living. You understand what I'm saying? And uh, that was actual facts. You know, I found myself at a point of time living my life out here where you know, I did whatever it took to survive in a sense. And, you know, the father that I known of at the time is who I spoke on, just to be actually totally honest with you. And then that was the guy who my mom always kind of laced me up and known. I'm actually named out of, after him, James David Brown. But later on in life, I found out, you know, at the age of 27, that that wasn't even my real father, you oh. know. Straight okay. up and down. But it was facts from where I was speaking that because that was the only man I ever known as a father. And uh, he is my sister's father. But as um, far as being my father, nah. You know, my mom, uh, she has a pretty interesting story herself. You know, and uh, I actually met my real father. You know, like I say, I've already became who I am today when I met my father, and it's a crazy story, that the way I met my father, you know, uh, I tell you, you know, I was on my way to do a show one day, 27 years old, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, I had grown this passion for, for motorcycles. I actually bought me a Harley before I even knew how to ride it, you know? And I had this Harley fever is what we call it. So on the way to do the show, we were leaving from this city. I seen a group of guys, maybe 50, 60 dudes on bikes, uh, kind of headed up uh, the opposite direction that I was going on the interstate. And, um, you know, something just was enticing me behind the way that they were riding. Honestly, it was two guys in the front and the rest of the guys kind of was a little bit back in two lines in one lane. And they all was coordinated with the same purple and I think purple gold and black jackets or what or whatnot. So it kind of caught my attention, like, who is that? You know, traffic slowing down and all of that. Um, as we got on down the interstate going to do this concert, I get a call from my mother. And uh, prior to me seeing this event, maybe a week or so earlier, my mom's had kind of had a breakdown where she, you know, had basically came out and told me, you know, James is not your real father. Your real father is a guy by the name of Kenny Black and who he was. And she felt, you know, this emotional thing about kind of keeping him away from me throughout my life. And she has her own reasons for that and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, I will say he a real one. I just, I'll say that much, you know, so for me, um, I had to comfort my mother on like, I'm a grown man now. Mom, there's no, no reason to feel like that. It's okay. And, you know, I'll meet him when I get a chance. But he was putting pressure on my mom throughout these years, especially watching me as his son become who I am. And it got to the point, I think it was overwhelming for her, where she broke down and told me the things because his whole thing throughout these years was trying to get to me. And, get him be a part of my life. And my mom's kind of resented that. She, I have no family in Cashville. Uh, you know, my mom's is originally from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, right beside where Pac's mom's from, you know. And um, she, uh, she came here on a scholarship to go to TSU and then the presence became pregnant with me and had me. My mom's actually graduated with Oprah, Win Oprah Winfrey. Too tall Jones. Oprah Winfrey's from here. So, mm. uh, you know, she uh, have, all, like I said, her own reasons for moving, I guess, me around the way she did. But I came out pretty well. So I kind of comfort her into that world of understanding that, you know, I'm a man, moms. You know, it is what it is, you know. And um, I get a call while I'm on, <laughs> while I'm on the way to the show. 
And it's my mom. I'm like, what's going on, mom? She's like, where you at? And I'm like, I'm on my way to do a show. And I could kind of hear in her voice, but at the same time, I'm hearing motorcycles in the back. I'm like, well, mom, where you at? She's like, I'm on this porch. Your daddy done came down here looking for you. He's got all these, they done took up the whole entire street. And, and, and all these peoples are out here in front of my house with cameras taking pictures of them and all of this good stuff. And I'm, it's just like God snapped in my head. And I'm, the first words I said was, mom, you know, did they have on purple jackets? You know what I'm saying? Because I don't know what it was. It was just this feeling of, uh, maybe that's who she talking about. And she was like, yeah, they all got on purple jackets. And it was almost like one of those moments in my life where I was like, this, this is, can't be real. And she was like, how do you know that? If you're on the interstate, I said, well, mom, I just passed him. I think I just passed him. And, uh, you know, he got on the phone, was like, son, hey, I come to see you. I think he was leaving uh, a big motorcycle meet somewhere and they were actually on the way to DC because uh, my father stays in DC. And uh, he was on his way back, but detoured with the guys to come come down and see me. And I, and I was gone, so. You know, we had a quick conversation throughout the phone uh, real fast and wanted to let me know, you know, about other brothers and things like that that I may have. And, and you know, just just that moment of we got to get together type of situation. You know, it's my son. You know, I'm proud of you. I don't want nothing from you, son. I, I do my own thing. I got my own thing. My pops is a real rider. He's uh, actually the, uh, the president of the Flaming Knights, one of the first black motorcycle gangs. If I ain't, I ain't gonna say gangs or groups or whatever they consider they said clubs, but he's uh, the president. I think it's thirty nine chapters or so, but he's he's pretty known in the motorcycle world, and uh, he's a real rider. He owns five bikes. He rides year round. Don't even own a car, and I never know where this urge for these bikes came from, but not know now, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, that conversation right there led to uh, me, you know, telling them, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll see you soon. And uh, the next time I was able to see him, because I've only seen him twice up until this date, not to say it's his fault nor mine, it's just that's the way things has been. And uh, I was doing a show, man, in, in Greenville, well, Johnson City, it's a, spot in Tennessee. And the promoter was like, yo, man, your father's here. I'm like, what? My father here? You know? He was like, yeah, bro. Like, it's your pops. You know what I mean? So that was the first time I got to look at him in his eyes. And I'm like, damn, it is another me out here, you know, because we really resemble each other. You know what I'm saying? And he even got the same kind of goatee thing and all of that thing. <laughs> so it was like, you know, that was how my situation played out in regards to meeting my father. And, um, being born from here uh, didn't come with me having family here. You know, uh, all my people are kind of spread it out throughout North Carolina and DC, LA, you know, all over the world. But, you know, I just happened to be born here and this is my home, you know? You started rapping at 12 years old? Yeah, between 12, 12 13 years old, yeah. Okay, and then at 14, you performed in front of Birdman? I did, I did. Changed my whole entire life into the, the music business. That was, that's when my journey started. You know, um, at the age of 13, man, I, like I say, I was in these streets in a real way, you know, as far as being a youngster trying to find a way. My mom's, uh, was blessed to graduate and, and come out of college and have a good job. And my mom's actually a social worker. And uh, she uh, she kind of was one of them ladies who poured her life into school and into work. And uh, she got so many different degrees and stuff like that, that, you know, my life started to change once my mother lost uh, lost her job in, in, in the middle of a merger of a hospital. She worked at a hospital. And uh, she worked, lost her job based on the situation that, uh, you know, kind of surrounds a, another family member where, you know, I'll speak for black parents, you know, we, 
black parents tend to whoop your ass with switches. And, you know, I don't really, I'm not singling out white or no other race thing, but I just know black parents, it's common for a parent to say, hey, go out there and get that switch. I'm gonna whoop your ass. You gotta go get the switch yourself. So, you know, my mom was one of them ladies who, you know, she she demanded re her respect. You know, she was the 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 mother, the mother and the father in my world. So, you know, she also had and still to this day have custody of her sister's children. So, and that was two, three of them, three of three of of my mom's sister children were. Uh, almost like my brothers and, you know, sisters, because one of them was actually with my mother before I was even born. And, uh, you know, it was just one of those times where she ended up whooping, you know, whooping, whooping my, uh, my niece's ass, man. And, uh, at the time, man, she, uh, she was young and she made the mistake of, you know, calling the police and, creating this whole thing about, oh, she hit me with this phone cord or what or what not. And uh, just to be honest with you, they kind of, I think, charged my moms with a child abuse type of situation. She worked around kids her whole entire life. With that being on her record, she was never able to kind of regroup from that. And everything she worked for throughout school went away because she never was able to go back into the position of the job that she spent the whole life in school for. So that sent me from, you know, living this middle class life to straight, straight to the straight to the bottom of the borough. And uh, you know, I I vowed to myself as a youngster that uh I would I would get my mama out of those conditions. So my journey started from the streets at a very young age, between eleven and twelve, you know, I was already out and kinda had it figured out on how to get money out here. So at the age of 13 and 14, you know, it was a little bit broader than the average 13 or 14 year old child would have been because, you know, I was already adapted to getting money and things like that. And I always had this love for music, you know, period. I remember my uncles at ages at 11 and 12, they would say, yo, yo rap, you know what I mean? Spit some of this, you know, rap that you be doing. At the time, I really didn't write raps or none of that. I just liked it and I would freestyle it. But uh, at the age of 14, man, right here in this city, to be all the way honest with you, uh, happened to be with one of my uh, closest partners, a brother from another mother, little Jimmy. We had been rolling around. And uh, I think at the time, I don't remember that CD. I don't know if it was Chopper City in the ghetto or but it was a BG CD or it was a CD that was from Cash Money Records. And at those times, the CDs used to come with the numbers on the back of them where you could kind of get in touch with the office or whatever, you know. And uh, we, were, we were really joking in regards to uh, calling them. Lil Jimmy had called the number on the back. And he was asking them, you know, what y'all want to come down here, you know, as far as performing, because they were hot. You know, it was kind of like the wave of what was going on at that time. And I think Baby had said something around $5,000 or something like that. And we was like, what? We couldn't believe it. I think I probably had 5000 in my pocket, let alone the other guys. So they was like, what? Y'all can get here tomorrow <laughs> type of situation. So... You know, we uh, immediately end up, well, he did, uh, lining up the situation to get them here to do a show. Paid them to get a show, rented out one of the spots here. We didn't know what we were doing, so, you know, wouldn't nobody really at the show. We didn't know about promoting. We honestly just wanted to meet them more than anything because we was fans of the music and kind of what they were speaking on was what we were living in a real way. And... uh they came here and uh, I never had an idea that they went through, Lil Jimmy went through with getting them here. He just happened to uh, send one of the partners over to pick me up out of what we would call the trap today. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and bring me over to this studio. And uh, when I walked into the studio, you know, 
I'll never forget it, man. The first person I seen was Lil Wayne. I was like, damn. You know, and uh, he had walked by. The gym was like, come here, man. And um, Baby was there. Baby first words to me, I'll never forget him in life, was when he looked at me, he looked at me up and down. And he said, spit something, Lil one. And um, at that time, he just called me at the best time of probably my my young life because, like I say, be prior to these, you know, love for music. I hadn't wrote music, but when he had told me to spit something, I had a folder full of music in my head. I, I was writing every day in the trap. You know, I was one that would sit there and take care of business, but at the same time, I used to write a lot to other people's beats and the music that was out. So when he told me to spit some, you know, I was ready. You know what I mean? And uh, I, I, I went to do my thing. And, uh, you know, as uh, soon as he heard me, man, I he, he immediately called uh, Lil Wayne in, into the room. He's like, hold up, Wayne, come here. So me and Wayne had a standoff almost. You know, Wayne spit. I would spit, Wayne would spit, I would spit. And it, it turned into one of those things where it was clearly a battle. And even to this day, I, I, I would say, I won't say that I won or Wayne won. I will say I came out of that room respected because when they left, baby was saying, hey, I'm, I need to bring him with me. I'm gonna make him a part of, uh, of, of, of cash money. And that's exactly what happened with my life. It was one of those things where I met Baby in the, in, in the studio here. I ended up spitting and I think BG Juvenile, they had came in, they never rapped. It was just strictly me and Wayne, you know? And I think BG and Juvie gave the, and Turk gave the, the nod of, I man, he, he's the shit too. And Baby took me from, uh, from this city, from Nashville, and my life started in New Orleans. So I went from, you know, being a youngster running around my city doing whatever I did to basically becoming a part of Cash Money and start my journey into being a, a Cash Money artist. I never was given a contract throughout my time of ever being with Cash Money. Uh, what we did was brought everything that we had to offer to the picture that they had already painted and was painting to the world. And I think the goal was to, you know, do all we can to help put me in position to be able to, you know, do my thing as an artist in regards to my brothers who put me in that position with him. And uh, so you will see when you look at Juvenile's Hum video, the yellow Ferrari, that belongs to us. The blue Jaguar, that belongs to us. The Hummer, the yellow Hummer, that belongs to us. You know, we were the ones that were basically uh, adding a lot of the realism to the materialistic th side of things, to the flavor of what they were actually speaking on and living as well with the whole bling bling things, you know? So, uh, I became a part of Cash Money, and uh, I was set to be, I guess, what, the sixth hot boy, pretty much. You know, I had a lot of records that was with uh, with the crew at the time, and, you know, Baby would basically use what he had, to, had coming outside of just what the hot boys was already bringing in regards to going to get the situation I think they got with Universal and things like that. So of course they know they had the hot boys and stuff like that, but he would say, well, look, Dino, I think Dino was it, it was the guy that was there at that time. He'd be like, yo, you know, this my, this my, this my golden glove right here. You know what I'm saying? And I probably rapped in front of every record executive that is probably the biggest ones today because he was on his mission as well and to expand the cash money into what you see it is today. And, uh, you know, 
I did everything in a sense of just being a, at an age when I was supposed to technically, quote unquote, be in school. I was in New Orleans running around with baby when he would drop Wayne and Turk off at school. I was the one that would be in the car with him and traveling throughout New Orleans and just picking up the life of New Orleans and doing whatever it was. Like I say, I was a little, little bit advanced in, 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 a, in a sense of to the streets and things like that. And um, I probably spent three, four years of being amongst, you know, cash money in the background and just traveling throughout the world, living in Anoya with Turk and his moms or with Juvie and just the whole culture of New Orleans to this very day is like my second home. I got UTP tatted on my arm, Uptown Projects. You know, uh, I, I spent, you know, yeah, three, four years of just, I guess I want to tag it along in a sense of just being the one that was chasing the career, just waiting for my shot. Let me say that much. I just want to point out that at the time that you got with Cash Money, you were only 14 years old. Yeah, every bit of it. You were, you were barely a teenager. Yeah. Uh, and Little Wayne, I guess at that time, wasn't even called Little Wayne. He was Baby D. Yeah, he was a youngster, bro. He, uh, he was basically baby D, you know what I'm saying? Or, you know, he, he he just was younger than everybody. What always amazed me about Wayne was that he never, it's like he wrote, at that time he wasn't even cussing. You know, he didn't even curse in his raps, bro. But Wayne could hang and rap with the best of them, including myself. So it was just amazing to me of him being even younger than I was, you know, being somebody that, like I say, he's truly talented. I can give you that. Nobody wrote Wayne's raps or none of that. You know, Wayne was one of them ones that was just blessed with the talent of being what you hear and see today, you know? Well, when you got with Cash Money, they were, you know, independent and rolling but mm -hmm. then a couple of years later, and you touched on this, they did that deal with Universal. Mm -hmm. And that was like, you could almost say the, the deal of the century. Uh, it was a $30 million deal. They got a $3 million advance. 85% of the ro royalties they got to keep, 50% of the publishing, and they owned all the masters. A lot so, of that goes to Wendy, Wendy Day. Wendy Day, yeah. Yeah, I know salute as well. to Wendy Day. I, I look at Wendy Day almost like a mom's to the even to this very day. Like that's when I first met Wendy, was being a part of them and watching her, you know, do her thing in regards to uh, playing her parts and her roles into helping them get that deal and getting that situation. I, I I I witnessed it, you know, and watched watched it all happen, and um, you know from there. I was just waiting on my turn, Vlad. Like, you know, when it, whenever whenever baby says it's time to go, buck is your shot. I was I was just there waiting. And, you know, I started to realize that uh, you know, time started going by, I was getting older, and I look back and I'm like, damn, I'm I'm 18, 17. I have to be 18 and and I still haven't even been heard. Uh, my whole thing was just wanting to be heard. I, I really wasn't, you know, off into the business, especially as how I am today. But, you know, at that age, man, the whole thing, I think for me was just being heard and letting the world be the judge of me and let the world put me in the position of, uh, wherever they wanted me to land at. So I was just always waiting for my opportunity with, with, with Cash Money. Well, you're with Cash Money. They signed that deal with Universal. And then in 98, Juvenile drops 400 degrees. And then you guys are off to the races. Off to that the was, I, I remember when that album dropped. That was the biggest thing in hip hop. Bleed at the time. It was a whole new sound. The music was different. The rapping was different. The visuals were different. And then, you know, right after that, you know, 
they dropped Lil Wayne's album. They dropped the Big Timers album. Like they started dropping album after album Every, after yeah. album, and all of them were going platinum or double platinum or whatever else. And I was You're getting with, lost more and more and the more. In the, <laughs> I was getting. I think with all the success that was coming with them, and Baby having to stay, and I understand it now. At the time, I really didn't understand it. You know, just to be honest, but. You know, like you said, they were dropping all of these different albums and Baby was basically chasing the success with the artist that was actually winning. I don't think he was looking to take the time to try to get another artist established when he already got a group that's doing so much. And I made it on my own decision to say, you know what, let me just get up out this loop. Because what had happened was I had built my city around me being amongst cash money. So I was dealing with the back and forth going from New Orleans and coming back home and bringing that same aura to my city. But it got to a point where it's like, okay, man, it's been three, four years and we ain't heard you on nothing. You know what I'm saying? Or we see you in the whoa, 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 chemo Sabi video or you know, but where's the music? And like I say, I, I became older, a little more eager for wanting my shot to happen. And uh, I left, I left and um, came back home and just started to uh, basically, that's where the independence of me as an artist started was once I left from Cash Money, I came back to ground zero. And I created a name for myself throughout my city from a broad level to the point where I started to kind of get off into the business. And at the time, it was only costing me, you know, I don't know, you know, to press up a thousand CDs at that time, man, you may cost it a, a thousand dollars to press up a thousand CDs, you sell them for $10 a piece. So you do the math. And I and I started independently pushing myself, but I had a, a buzz based off of me being from him, being with Cash Money. So I started to release, you know, my own independent projects and hand to hand in these CDs throughout my city and started realizing that uh, not only was I making myself known from a music standpoint and they finally hearing me and knowing how I, you know, what I had to bring for us from an artist standpoint, but I was actually making money and it was keeping me from actually doing what I've always known to do and that's hustle in the streets. So, you know, here it is. I was, it, it cost me $350, I think, now that I know exact to press up a thousand CDs. You sell them for $10 a piece. That's, 10 bands, you know what I'm saying? So for me, I started realizing from the very beginning that in my mind was this is this is how I'm gonna hustle this thing and that's what that's what it started for me, you know. Um I came in and uh started to uh you know create this self-promotion type of thing. I was the one that you would see throughout this city hanging his own posters up the wall and and all of that stuff, man. I've been through all of those eras of, you know, really touching bases and, and, and getting out here and hand to hand in with these CDs to get myself in the position, I guess where I'm at today, because this is where it all started from. Well, when you were with Cash Money, you know, there's the infamous picture of uh, Baby kissing Wayne. And okay. I remember when I talked to Turk about this, he said, yeah, we, we kind of kissed each other like that on some mafia type shit. You, you know, a lot of people have made an issue over, uh, over uh, Baby and, and Wayne kissing in the lips. And, you know, Baby explained that, I remember on a radio show saying, you know, that's my son. You know, if you have kids, you understand. Yeah. I mean, that situation, man, it was like, see, they caught them in the moment where the fans and, and the media and all of it, they made it out of issue that it wasn't, you know what I'm saying? It's just like the mob. 
You know, they, they kiss each other all the time, you know what I'm saying? Ain't nobody gonna go to them and say they no bitch or no hoe or none of that. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not with baby them to this day. You know what I'm saying? I never say that that's what they is, you know what I'm saying? That just was was something that a nigga did in the in-house. Just like nigga play basketball, nigga might make a shot, nigga hit him on his ass. That don't mean he a fag. That mean, you know what I'm saying, nigga, good job. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you're a man, man, like, I mean, you know, people just look at that different. You know what I'm saying? I just, I didn't see it that way. You know what I'm talking about? Sure. Did, did other people in Cash Money do that or was it just Baby and Wayne? Nah, man, we all used to do that shit. That was an in-house thing. Like, nigga used to be like, you know what I'm saying? Nigga, you, nigga, you got love for a nigga, nigga, how much you love me? It just was a homeboy thing, you know what I'm saying? They got a lot of click of niggas, might, might, might play all kind of games with they niggas in-house, you know what I'm saying? But when the media get to it, they going to blow it out of proportion. You know how they do it, you know what I'm saying? The only one really ain't used to do that shit was Juvenile. Like I say, Juvenile was older. Now, to this day, I wouldn't do that shit, but back then, we were young, you know what I'm saying? It was all love, man. We had love for each other, like... Right now, I got baby and slim name tatted in my chest. You know what I'm saying? That's what the type of love that we had for each other. But he said, yeah, I mean, that was actually happening. Did you ever see that? Uh, yeah. I mean, baby never played with me like that. Don't let me clear that up. You understand what I'm saying? I never seen baby play with juvenile like that. You know what I'm saying? But Turk is right. You know what I'm saying? I, I seen him kind of do it in a playful manner in the thing. It wasn't like, like Turk probably explained to you, it was, I don't know if it was a mafia or what it was, but for me, it was something that, you know, I viewed as that's them type of thing, you know, because, you know, I think I seen Wayne, Turk, and even BG kind of push that line at a point in time for us, the embracement that he had with them. And they had this fatherly bond with baby like that. So, you know, I guess that's what that came from, but I never just, I never seen them ever play with juvenile or, or, or myself in no kind of way like that. But I witnessed it, I witnessed it and shit, you know. Well, you move back to Nashville and I guess you're kind of mixed up in the streets by that time. And then in 2000, there was a home invasion. Believe that. And uh, okay. talk, talk about that situation. Yeah, man, I got back home and of course got back out here. And even though I was, like I explained on, you know, independently trying to push my music, you know, I was still doing what I had to do in the sense of survival in the sense, you know, out here. And uh, it was just one of those situ situations where, you know, when you in the streets, you kind of know what comes along with the streets. And uh, robberies and things of that nature, they come along with the streets, you know. I happened to be in a home at the time, me and uh, a few more individuals. And, you know, it was, I don't know, one or two in the morning, lights, had, I remember the lights going completely black. I was sleeping in the middle of the floor and uh, I had a 12 gauge laying on the floor beside me. And the pop my partner who Spotty was at the time, he was like, he was gone out of town. And he had said something to me that he never had said. And it was keep that vest on while I'm gone. You know, of course I used to have to take care of the business, but even at that time, I'm like, all right, and didn't have that vest on. And even if I did, I don't think it would have played a part in, in 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 the situation in itself because it was done kind of professional the way the the way the guy the guys came or whatever to see me in that situation um, two in the morning lights click off and then they click back on but when they click back on only a few of them stayed on one in the kitchen and one in the back room when every light was on at first in the house but they clicked back on. And from that moment, I just remember hearing a <clears throat> like a pull on the screen door. We didn't have no security door that was a bar door or none. And it was really the regular type of screen door that come along, standard screen door on the house. 
And um, I just heard a, a pull on the door and then immediately, boom, you know, and uh, I kind of was laying under a cover, had the cover kind of over my head so I could kind of peek through the corner of my eye. And I just remember seeing, you know, a guy in all black with a string attached to the chopper. And he was just like, just don't nobody move, you know. And um, once he started to make his way into the house, like I said, it was a 12 gauge that was laying on the floor and it was solid chrome at that. And I think once he noticed and looked down and actually seen that gun, he immediately went to filling the cover. I could feel the barrel coming up the, the cover. You know what I'm saying? Cause I was asleep on the floor. So he got this barrel and I remember feeling it like towards my lower back, kind of moving up. And just the fear, I guess, of, of getting shot in the back of the head or something just, I looked up a little bit and I could see feet sticking out beside the refrigerator. And I ran, you know, towards the kitchen area. And when I ran towards the kitchen area, uh, a guy, you know, popped out, 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 out beside the refrigerator and hit him once or twice. So once he got hit, I kind of turned around and seen him take the shots, but they really didn't phase him at all because he raised that chop up and just started spraying ram randomly, like brrr. And uh, I think the first two I took immediately, but I kind of was diving towards the uh, uh, side. So I kind of got hit in the arm and in the leg at the time, like right beside my main artery that runs down your, your legs. And sh so, you know, I crawled into the kitchen and my partner was still shooting and ducking and trying to get off from from out of the kitchen against him, but I'm watching the walls fly off and shit. And he was just spraying, spraying, spraying in the house, you know? And I remember to this very day, I just, I don't know why my prayer was that. I didn't pray to say, Lord, don't let me get shot or Lord, don't let me die. I was actually asking God, Lord, please don't let me get hit in the head. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was just saying, Lord, please don't let me, to myself. You know, because I'm looking up and watching the floor, the walls just kind of disintegrate. It was just, he was spraying. And uh, the shot stopped for a quick second. And then I remember my partner about to come out of the side of the refrigerator because he was ducking off and kind of shooting with him. And uh, the guy just stuck the gun around the door and just sprayed some more. His body was outside of the house, but he just stuck it in, sprayed a little more. And uh, by that time, the gunshot stopped. Um, you know, I looked down, and my whole entire pants was red. I didn't know where I got shot at. I knew my arm was damn near hanging off at the time. You know what I'm saying? I was, I seen that and, you know, we had so much other shit that was, within the home that uh, I probably rode around an hour, hour and a half, maybe close to an hour in the back seat, just taking things to different places before my partners took me to the hospital. We had to, it was either that or where, or where whatever comes along with when the police get there. So I was blessed to just get shot in the house. Let me say that much. And, uh, when I got to the hospital, you know, I was dropped off or almost, I ain't gonna say dropped off. My guys had brought me into the hospital and the detectives was already there waiting on, 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 on us to get there, to be honest with you. So when my guys tried to, you know, drop me off at the hospital, they were like, hold on. You know, I remember hearing the detective telling my partner, you know, what happened back there at the house? We know he got, where he got shot at the home. And my partner's like, what house? I just picked him up shot. He was like, man, don't tell me no bullshit, man. And my partner was like, bro, I just picked him up. You know what I mean? I don't know what happened or whatever. And then he, before I kind of went all the way out, because I passed out from the loss of blood. But before I passed out, I still remember the detective grabbing his T-shirt 
and said, will you explain this? And I kind of raised up on the stretcher and seen what he was talking about. And uh, my partner had a white T-shirt that had like three, four clean holes, bullet holes. You could still see the burnt marks on the shirt that was in it in a line up his shirt. And he was he was kind of lost stuttering from there. You get what I'm saying? And everything kind of went blank for me from there until the next day I walk, woke up and I had lost so much blood. That's what it, you know, they end up having to do the whole blood transfusion and all of that good stuff to get me back to where I'm at through the grace of God. And, you know, unfortunately that's what come along with the streets. But from that moment of me being shot, I made a decision within myself and within life that changed my whole entire life in regards to making my rap career happen. You know, uh, God bless the dead in a sense. You know, God bless the guy who shot me. He's no longer living. Oh, so you know who shot you? Yeah, yeah, I know who shot me. You know what I'm saying? And uh, like I say, he's no longer here. I don't know how Yeah, I mean, died. karma. You go around spraying up people's houses, you probably don't have a long, a long life to live. Yeah. Shit happens. I don't, I don't know what shit, happens. Shit happens. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you get through that horrific experience and you start focusing on your music again. Exactly. Um, you, were, you were on the song Memphis with 3-6 Mafia and Project Pat. Yes, sir. That was, I think, one of your early kind of big appearances. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Um, and then you you left Cash Money along with Juvenile. Yep. Well, I when I had left before Juvenile had left, in the midst of after getting shot is when I met Paul from DJ. Well, I actually met DJ Paul when I was with Baby during those times because they were going to do the record that they had out there uh, with. I forget the name of the record, but they had a record with the Hot Boys and 3-6 Mafia. And uh, Baby was basically showing me off the Paul, like, yo, I got I got this little one from your city. I mean, from your state, from Nashville, because they from Memphis. That's what I got coming. And, and spit something for them, Buck. You know what I mean? So I end up rapping in front of Paul at a very, very young age. And... Uh, after I had got shot and been through all of that, Paul had sent Project Pat and another guy by name of Lil Buck or Buck. His name was Buck, but he sent them to come pick me up to to actually, at the time, to make me a part of 3-6, I'm going to be honest, a, a hypnotized mind records because it was for a feature. But I think that I kind of glowed on Paul it stood on him from when he first met me and he just gave me that opportunity of being a part of that record that you hear me on. Uh, it was the Posse song was my first record with them. And it was basically a lot of individuals on the song, you know what I'm saying? And he, I had like an eight bar verse or something on there. But I, to this very day, Paul is one of my, one of my favorite guys and one of my closest mentors and everything because he's always believed in me before I, you know, I became buck to the world or any of that. He played a big part into a, you know, you know, just trying to get get me out of the environment and get me to do the right thing. Even now, man, I just had a conversation with him the other day. He's like, yo, you ready now? And things like that. So, you know, in the future, I'm sure you're about to hear some music from me and Paul as well. But at that time, uh, like I say, he sent Project Pat down. And it was crazy because Project Pat was uh, like the shit, like the biggest, biggest shit going on for us throughout the, uh, especially Tennessee. You know, that's when he had the whoop, whoop, chicken, chicken records and a lot of big records that he had that was just like the shit. And here it is. He and a black navigator meet me at Burger King by Joe Johnson. It's a project out here picking me up, taking me to Memphis. So uh, from there, I became a part of that record and, uh, you know, my rap hustle and independently kept going here and then Juvenile, Juvenile left Cash Money. Well, I would 
say my relationship, if it was with anybody throughout Cash Money, the strongest relationship I had was definitely would be with uh with Juvenile, you know, and BG. But Juvenile, you know, he was one of them guys that just, you know, would always kind of bring me outside of just being in the office at Cash Money all the time and shit and just, you know, being a person that's from out of town there to work. But he brought me out to experience the streets in New Orleans. So I became a part of the Magnolia Projects with Juvenile and everything that surrounded Juvenile was kind of like from the project as well. And he was like my closest partner. So once he had left from Cash Money, he reached out to me and was like, yo, bro, I know you've been around since a youngster. And bro, I've, I'm, I've stepped away from, from Cash Money at this point and I got my own thing going, which is UTP Records. And uh, man, I wanna, I wanna make you a part of the group. I can't promise you nothing, but I will promise you one thing, but you will be heard. <laughs> And honestly, man, I never dug off into why Juvie had left cash money or got off into his business. Like I say, I just made the decision of saying, all right, cool, let me, I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna take this opportunity with Juvenile. And I did, you know, I found myself right back in New Orleans. Now it's probably what, 2000 and, yeah, right around 2000, 2001. 2000, and, yeah, around 2001, 2000, and we were pushing UTP records. That was the uh, that was the push for me. Juvie was spending so much of his own money trying to keep everybody afloat. You understand what I'm saying? And and himself at that time, that uh, things started getting real rough. I think he was trying to, you know, he's fighting with Cash Money back and forth over whatever they were fighting over at the time. And, uh, you know, he gave not just myself, but he gave all of the artists this this conversation one day. When I say all the artists, meaning me, Wacko, Skip, Corey C. He just told us, he was like, look, things is fucked up. You know what I'm saying? It's hard for me to kind of keep going with this. So I'm gonna just tell y'all, if y'all come across opportunity and it's real, then take advantage of it, even if it's not with me. And that was something that stood in the back of my head, but I knew how hard things were becoming for Julie. So just happened to be one day while we were together uh, and I was a part of UTP where we were on our way to New York City to meet his lawyers. And God bless the dead, but uh, CeeLo, CeeLo was the bus driver, which later became Birdman's right-hand man. And he just passed away not too long ago. But uh, yeah, rest in peace to CeeLo. He, uh, he, he was the bus driver for us, and he's actually from New York. So when we were on the way to New York to actually go see Juvenile's lawyer, which was up there, in regards to him, you know, fighting this situation. Juvie did a lot of traveling by bus. He didn't really do a lot of flight and flying and things like that. So we got to New York. And when we got to New York, we had a studio on our bus. And when we got to New York, um, CeeLo, the bus driver, was playing this music and was like, getting juvenile to listen to um, who was hot throughout New York City at the time. And it was 50. And, and, you know, 50 had dropped this uh, 50 Cent is the Future. I think that's what it was with him, Banks, and, and, and Yale at the time. And this CD was just the shit to me too, you know, because CeeLo was playing this shit on the bus. And I'm like, man, these niggas is really live like that. Like, the fuck? Well, Juvenile liked it, the music as well. And then CeeLo was like, well, look, you know, my guy manages manages 50. I can get him over here on the bus when we get up there and get him to record, see, see what y'all come up with. 
And when we got to New York, that's exactly what we what he did. But CeeLo happened to be good friends with Shot Money. And uh, when we got to New York, he stressed out the Shot Money. Shot Money ended up bringing 50 and Banks and Yayo. All of them came by the bus. And I just happened to be on the bus at the time. And, um, you know, Juvenile and 50 was in the back of the bus working on whatever record. And I was in the front of the bus with uh, the rest of the guys uh, just playing records. You know, Banks was there. Yayo was there. I remember Yayo had a fucking pack of crack on him. It's like, yo, I'm still in the streets, D. And you know, whoop de whoop de whoop type shit. But them niggas were serious at that time, I guess, based on the fact of what 50 was going through with the whole Supreme shit. You know, they was vested up and all of that good shit, you know, strapped up and all of that. But they were really no different than anybody else from the streets, you know what I'm saying? But they were really living that shit at the point, at that at that point in time. Uh 50 as well, you know, I don't take nothing back take nothing from him, but he was really living the shit that he was speaking on at that time. And um, I was just playing a record, bro, in the front of the, the front of the bus. And Banks said, hold on, run that back. And uh, he's like, yo, man, I gotta let 50 hear this shit. 50 gotta hear this. And I'm like, okay, cool. Well. He calls 50 to the front of the bus and was like, man, hit this, check this out. You know what I mean? And 50 heard the record and he was like, yeah, that shit's crazy. That shit's crazy right there. But he showed no emotion to, let me say, signing me or nothing like that. He was just like, it was crazy. You know what I'm saying? And uh, from there, that was the first time, quote unquote, I met 50 Cent in my life was basically being on a tour bus with Juvenile and them recording me playing a record that they all were liking at the time. And I would never imagine how that one record that I played played such a big part into my career and life with G-Unit because from there we drove cross country the next day from New York to L.A. It took us a few days to get there, but we were actually on our way to LA to go get up with Suge Knight. And uh, that's exactly what we went to do. And, uh, you know, I ain't got no bad shit to say about Suge. All I can say is he was a real dude in my eyes. He took this likeness likeness to me from the very beginning of being around Suge at, at that at that age and at, and at that time, uh, Juvenile was going out to become a part of Death Row Records. And uh, he was bringing the crew with him as well. He was basically signing himself and us, from my understanding, to Death Row Records. And he was explaining like, man, we're gonna go out here and do this situation with Suge. And, we kind of know what it was, what it what it was, but you know, we rocking with you, bro. You know what I mean? Yo, yo, when you lay your hat as your home, is what we gonna lay our hat and make it our home as well. So that was the outlook for me and all the other guys that was a part of UTP at that time. So, you know, we here we are in LA now. Keep in mind, prior I just met 50. And we in LA, we probably Stayed out in LA, man, under sugar expense for a week and a half, two weeks. And uh, I kind of really didn't have nothing to do with the business of things. It was just whatever Juvenile and Suge Knight was agreeing upon and handling at that time. And honestly, bro, I was just being who I am in regards of uh, an individual that Suge took a liking to. So, you know, he would, he would be like, Buck, come here, bro. Come out here and chill with me and shit like that. And smoke his cigars and let that fucking dog bite all on his arms and shit and tell me some of the most gangsterous and horrific stories and shit about these rappers and shit that you could imagine. And I got from the very beginning of Suge was an individual that 
you know, it's like any real person, though, you know, if you sense fear or something out of somebody, then you choose to use it the way ever you want to use it, you know? I guess I'm just, I, I, I just don't believe in having fear. I fear nothing, no man. I, I fear God. It's because I ain't met him yet. But, you know, I was one of them ones where, like I say, me and Suge had a very solid relationship in a sense to the point where, uh, you know, I look forward to waking up every morning knowing Suge about to pick us up and head over here to death row and, and get to work. You know, that's why I was able to meet Crooked Eye and all of those guys, even Corrupt and shit like that. You know what I mean? That You know, they were still a part of death row at that time. And here it is, Juvie coming around and coming a part of that. So we were adapting the whole death row thing as well as keeping it south, but bringing to the table what we were going to bring to death row. And to that one day, I will never forget in my life where, you know, uh, I had got accustomed to this routine of waking up, going down the juvenile room, waiting on Suge to pull up. We gone to the studio. Well, I woke up one morning, went down the juvenile room and he wasn't there. And I went to a few of the other guys' rooms like, yo, bro, y'all seen Jew? Nah, ain't nobody seen him. You know what I'm saying? I went to his brother, Corey C. room. Yo, bro, where Juvie at? And then he didn't know. And then that's when everybody started to discover, well, damn, the Cadillac truck gone. <laughs> because we had a Cadillac truck to you and a couple more vehicles that followed the bus. And Juvie wasn't answering no phones at that time or none of that. Like, it was like he was gone from at least my understanding. It may have been different, quote unquote, with his brother or so, but he, in regards to his brother at the time, his brother was, wasn't was able to even get in touch with him. So we were kind of like stuck. Like I say, Juvie was the anchor to the ship, so he paid for everything. And here it is that we're sitting here, you know, like, damn, where Juvie at? That was kind of like what, you know, you're looking for, you're looking for the, the, the the one who holds everything down. It, it, who, we're here for Juvie. You know, we're artists of Juvie. So um, that was one of the craziest days and experiences of my lifetime. But one of the most, it was like a gift and a curse because, you know, spent hours of sitting and waiting. And then I remember sitting in Juvenile's brother room. We all kind of panicking and wondering where Juvie at. And then the phone rings in his brother's room. And uh, I'm thinking, damn, there go Juvie, but but it was Suge on the other line. And I still remember hearing his voice through the phone because it was that quiet in the room, you know, where he said, uh, where Juvie at, y'all? Where, where Juvie at? I'm, I'm about to pull up. And I think his brother had to relate at the time, Juvie not here. But I'll never forget that what that came out of Suge. It was one of those, what? What you mean he's not, he, he's not there? And he was like, man, I don't know, bro. He just, he, he he's gone. Ju and Suge was like, he gone? What, what, what do you mean he gone? Like, what, what we supposed to, he was supposed to do the deal today. What do you mean he gone? And that's what I remember hearing. You understand what I'm saying and knowing. And, uh, you know, from that point, you know, I think his brother was explaining to Suge whatever he kind of knowed of the situation. I just remember him hanging up the phone and then the phone ringing again and it was the front desk of the fucking hotel saying, hey, man, y'all rooms has been lifted. You guys got to get out of here. You understand what I'm saying? Suge had canceled the fucking rooms and shit. And now you got 10 guys out here on the road that depend on one person for everything, direction, financial, direct, everything. And even the bus driver was needing money from him to be able to put gas on the bus, to be able to move the bus to where it needed to go. Uh, rest in peace to CeeLo, but uh, you know, it was just one of them days, bro, where everything went haywire. 
We couldn't find Juvie. We ended up getting kicked out of the hotel. So now we all piled up on the bus. Well, the bus driver needed money to be able to go get gas and all of that stuff. So only the generator runs for so long until ain't no gas going. We're in the middle of LA in fucking 100 degree weather. And now the generator stops. Bus driver has no money. It's so fucking hot on the bus and the guys is hungry and starving. So, you know, everybody started scrambling for whatever they know, whatever little bitches that they knew out there that could help the situation or if you could get somebody to send you some money to help you or whatever. Me personally, I reached out to my people, told them send me some bread enough to give me a plane ticket and get me back home. You understand what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, that's what happened, bro. I ended up getting enough money from my people where I was not only able to just take care of my own flight, I took care of a few of the other guys' flights and helped them get a few people get back to where they got. I think one of the guys or so had got enough money to send, well, we had a couple vehicles back, so he piled up whoever was gonna drive with him back to New Orleans. You know, he struck out and left. The bus driver got money sent to him, and he was more or less like, look, when this bread get here, I'm leaving at this time. If you ain't on this bus, then I'm gone, because everybody was going every which way to try to figure out something. So a few guys got left out that motherfucker, just to be real. And uh, man, you know, from there I vowed to myself to, uh, to that that was my the end of my journey in in a sense with UTP, and uh, that's how I rock. You know what I mean? I was like, you know, that that did it for me. You know what I mean? Because, you know, here it is. I I really wasn't even aware that we were being signed to Death Row as well, but he was actually taking and doing a label deal with Death Row as well as himself at the time, and from there. And this is, like I say, this is the knowledge that I have of the situation. Uh, but once I got back from that, bro, I was like, nah, I'm good on any of that. And out of nowhere, bro, I got this call, bro, from Sha Money, bro, through CeeLo. CeeLo had called me and was like, yo, bro, you know what I'm saying? Sha Money just called and asked about some record you was playing. And I was like, the record I was playing on the bus, he was like, yeah, bro. 50 wants to buy that record and put it on his album. I never in my life sold a record in my life. I didn't even know what the fuck to charge him, you know what I'm saying, or ask for in regards to that. But at that time, I was like, hell yeah, bro, they can, let's do it, or whatever, whatnot. So CeeLo kind of played manager in a sense of setting that record up with them and that record ended up being Bloodhound on 50 Cent's Get Rich or Die Trying. And that was a record that I already had. That was my record. 50 just basically kept my verse, one of my verses on that song and added two of his verses to it. And that's what you hear today as uh, far as the Bloodhound record go. And um, from there, that's when uh, 50 discovered that I had no situation as far as contractually obligations to UTP. And uh, he made an offer in, in regards to giving me a, a deal with G-Unit. And um, I, I didn't have a manager, none of that. Shout out to Ron Bird, which was Juvenile's manager at the time. I had a great and still do have a great relationship with, with him. Definitely good dude. One of the most realest dudes that I've met, you know, uh, I had to turn to him like, yo, man, I got this situation with G-Unit where they they saying bring me over there. And it was beyond exciting for me because Shaw Money's like, yo, M loves the record. M's mixing the record. And I'm like, M? You talking about M and M? He's like, yeah, bro. Like, M is mixing the record. If you look, M mm. mixed Bloodhound. And I'm like, what? This is one of my lightest records. I, I did this record in 10, 15 minutes. I couldn't believe that. They were so off into that record like that. Uh, but hey, man, that record changed my life. And uh, 50 gave me that opportunity to become a part of G-Unit based off of that one record. And didn't know basically 
my life or who I am, how I came up and how I'm rocking. I think he got to learn as I became a part of G Unit that he's dealing with a real one just as itself at the time, which made it better. So you sign a G Unit, 50 Cent drops Get Rich or Die Trying, and you have the song Bloodhound on there. Mm -hmm. And that album ends up being the biggest selling album of the year. True. Uh, it goes diamond, <laughs> uh, nine times platinum in the US alone. I told Fit that he was gonna sell 10 million records. He didn't believe me. See, this is crazy when I'm sitting here having this conversation with you because it brings me back to the moment when I was like, him playing this, this, this tape, and it was something that I've never heard, nor something I've never felt in music. To be honest, since I heard Pac, the same feeling that I was getting from that Pac era, that feeling, it was like, that's the same thing. So one day, I remember telling him, bro, you're gonna sell 10 million records. He was like, nah. I was like, bro, you're gonna sell 10 million. This gonna be, I don't know why 10. That's why I keep the 10 with me, everything I do. but. I end up telling 50, yo, before he sold 1 million records off of that tape, I said, bro, you're going you gonna to go diamond. You're going to sell at least 10 million records. And to watch, the, watch it play out like that was like, damn, here we go. Things happen so fast from there, Vlad. Oh, yeah. Now, that was, that was a hell of an album. It was. Uh, I mean, even Irv Gotti, who was you know 50's biggest enemy, even said that was a hell of an album. Well, you could be it the was biggest. Just undeniable. You could be there. You go. You could be the biggest hater in the world, but some things that you just can't you can't deny on. Like you cannot like a person, but just can't deny that they the shit. If you're real with yourself, you know. Yeah. Oh, a hell of an album. I, I love that album to death. For sure. Fifties, uh, you know, best album period to this day. Uh, one of the best hip hop albums period. I think to this day. Um, and now G Unit is off to the races. Yes, sir. Uh, so then after that, the the G Unit album drops. Beg for mercy. Exactly. And you're you're all over that album. Well, I basically was left with that album in my hands to create. Almost, I'll say that. Um, and I only say that not to put myself in front of the other guys, meaning Banks or Yayo, because Yayo was incarcerated at the time of making Beg for Mercy. He, right. uh, I think, uh, I think in the middle, or I can't really remember. Yeah, I, he was incarcerated because when I became a part of G Unit, people used to still get me mixed up with Yayo. So while we were running around on tour and shit with the whole Get Rich or Die Trying movement and me and Banks being in the background, people were so familiar with Yayo that didn't know Yayo or who he was, when they would think I was Yayo. You know what I'm saying? So uh, when we made Beg for Mercy, we kind of created that tape on the road. We were, I think that year we had did more shows than it was days of a year. You know, it was like 360 something shows or 370 something shows, you know, 365 days of the, of the year. we. We created this project on the road and um, that's where, you know, we would actually get the beats given to us. The music was coming through Shy Money giving us the music on a blank CD and us not knowing who the producers was on the, on the CDs. And we actually picked the music for the music, not for the name. So that, that, that CD was created by a lot of unknown producers as well as known producers or producers that became known and stuff like that. Um, outside of a few producers that were already, you know, already known producers or what or whatnot. But yeah, man, I played a big part in that, that whole uh, making of that tape. I mean, the first words that you hear on that CD is my voice. It's doom, 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 vacate your home. I come to break your bones, America's nightmare. We at it again, a Desert Eagle and a Black Mac 10. They'll never know what happened. 
that's the first words of that record. And uh, like I say, that that record right there was where I was even introduced to Dr. Dre because one of the mm. first records I ever recorded with with Dre was the one he produced with nothing but a, a, a G thing, G unit, and then it's, it's nothing but that record there. And he produced it. And uh, I just remember being in the studio and in LA and um, rocking my verse. And then all of a sudden hearing the voice saying, you know, yo, say it this way type of thing. Looking up in the glass and seeing Dr. Dre lean over that big board and give you that stare, it'll change your life, bro. <laughs> it's the doc, you know what I mean? I couldn't believe it. Like, you know, here I am, you know what I mean? Young Buck from Cashville, Nashville, Tennessee. And I got Dr. Dre in front of me telling me, yo, that's dope, man. See it this way and see how that feels. You know what I mean? And that was kind of the moment of that I remember of me kind of embracing I made it type of feeling was being in front of Dr. Dre and actually working, well, working and working with Dre, you know? Yeah. I mean, that was a hell of an album as well. For uh, sure. Popping Them Things was my favorite song on that album. That was produced by Dre and Scott Storch. Word. Uh, Stunt 101 was a Word. big single. Uh, Want to Get to Know You with Joe was it's a crazy. big song. Uh, I mean, Dre also uh, co-produced G'd Up. That's what I'm and, speaking uh, on. There's a first record, G'd yep. Up. Yep. For sure. And, and that album ends up going double platinum. Right. Uh, so now you're you're really starting to really build up. You you got one song on Get Rich or Die Trying. You got a bunch of songs on, on Beg for Mercy. Um, and then around that time, Game actually joins G-Unit. Right. Game and... Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, game game became a part of G Unit through the business of Dr. Dre and Fifty Cent. He never once, I think, was fully signed to G Unit. I think he always had a situation with G Unit and Aftermath, and I think it was a situation where they were trying to figure out, you know, what they were going to do with game and how they were going to do it and the energy. For us, when I say they, Interscope uh, and Jimmy and all of those guys at the time, you know, they knew game was, you know, the shit, you know, and they wanted to uh, get him in the best position as possible and we were the shit. So it made sense because, you know, we're all a, a family, you know, G-Unit, Shady, Shady Aftermath was kind of the push for, for the world. So it made sense. and. For me, it made even more sense because I was in tune with game and the music and I liked him as a person. I liked his music and still do to this day. Like, like I, I've always gave game his respect on being a dope ass artist. And we always had a pretty solid relationship. You understand what I'm saying? Even through the whole GU not beef and all of that shit, I always took a lot of those things that came from game from him doing what he had to do in a sense in order for him to stand up and, you know, bite back at some of the bullshit that he felt was going on. I just didn't take none of it personal from game, me personally. I, I just didn't because I had more of a solid relationship that had got established with game uh, during that time. And uh, uh, I do know 50 gave game a few records or what or what not. You know what I'm saying? That they end up being big records for game and things like that. But yeah. Oh, oh yeah. No, I was kind of rolling around with game. Like my first video project was with game. Uh, it was called The Devil's Advocate, where I picked up a video camera and just started filming him running around New York and LA. And then that came became our first project. And and I remember as he was getting ready to drop his first album. 50 was all over that album. I remember even the song with Nate Dogg, 50 originally did the hook and they took it off yep. and put Nate Dogg on it because there was too much 50 yep. on his album. Uh, on his they album. wanted to look like a joint album. Like <laughs> they wanted it to be a game album. So yeah. I, I, I remember that time very clearly. Yeah, and 50 played a big, big part in that, in that whole, that whole project in a real way. So, you know, game was yeah. a part of 
G unit and then we masked as a team at a one point in time together and that's what it was, you know, and that's how we carried it out. Um Yeah. It was but, a great great project too. Yeah, the game's first sure. album was, was my favorite project by him, period. I uh, like a lot of game shit. His first album is definitely one of those classics to me though, for sure. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so now you guys are are continuing to build up. Uh and then in two thousand four you dropped your debut album, Straight Out of Cashville. Straight out of Cashville. Uh Debuted at number three, ends up going platinum. Uh, Shorty Wanna Ride was a big song. Uh, Let Me In yep. uh, was a big song. Uh, Game actually shows up on your album on the song Stomp. Yep, yeah. So, so now you have your own big project that you're starting to push. Correct. But in the midst of you promoting this project, the Vibe Awards happens. Correct. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> that was a real, real awkward moment from the moment that I stepped foot in that building. I, I, I didn't know it would come out to be what it was, but I knew something was going to happen, just to be honest with you. And it was one of those tense situations where, uh, you know, by that time we had a lot of different problems with different individuals, different crews, you know, uh, 50 and us, we were we we wasn't in the, definitely in a space that you see him and Fat Joe in now. It was beef with those guys. Of course, Murder Inc. You know, the beef was there with those guys. And it was just, you know, all these tense different beefs with every fucking body. So at that award show, you know, was one of the first award shows where we were gonna be present with with some of these guys that we kind of quote unquote had problems with. And uh, I felt it would be a problem the moment that the uh, producer of the show actually brought back the seating arrangements and showed us where we would be sitting at. And uh, I took it back to 50, it was like, you know, look, check this out, Phil, they got us sitting right here, but then look, 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 look at who's all around us, you got, you know, Fat Joe and his crew here, and Irv Gotti here, and Irv Gotti's other brother on it. It was like we was almost, it was almost a circle formed around us, you know, of all individuals that we had problems with, you know? So once 50 became aware of it, you know, he kind of put it, put us in a position to, or put us in the mind frame of, uh, you know, y'all be on y'all shit in here. And when you do somebody like that with them myself and a few of the guys at that time, shit, we did exactly what we needed to do to make sure we were gonna be all right coming in and out of that situation. And then of course we had Eminem with us and Dr. Dre there, and you got Suge sitting here, you know, and things like that. So, you know, I knew to, to to make sure that we was together. All of us was together in regards if anything does pop off. And it did, you know, I remember walking in, into that award show and like I tell you from the beginning of this interview, you know, me and Suge always had a, a solid bond, a solid respect for each other. And even though my career ended up blossoming through G-Unit, which made me affiliated, of course, with Dr. Dre and M as well, I knew he had these personal issues or issues that he have with Dre that made me pretty much a part of that if he chose to make it that. But when we walked into that award show, I'll never forget seeing Petey Pablo and Suge was two of the first guys that we seen. And soon as Suge seen me, you know, I'm walking with Dre, I'm walking with him, I'm walking with 50. And we're walking right past Suge and Suge hollers, Buck, what up? Come here. You know, like I say, this is exactly what I did. I, I, I fucked with him. Like, so I went and hollered at him, you know, and me and Petey Pablo had a record where I was even featured on one of Petey's records as well. So I went to holler at him. And, uh, you know, Suge, Suge wasn't on no negative. You know, he was just basically hollering, saying, what up? And once I went over and hollered at him and shit, I dapped up and shit. And, let me know, man, I see you. 
you know, I'm proud of you and, you know, things like that. And I kept it moving and went on to our section. And I never forget, 50 was like, what'd he say to you? I said, nothing, bro. He was just like, you know, what up and shit, proud of me and shit, you know, things like that. 50 was like, all right, all right. But, you know, once we sit down at that table at that award show, man, I felt so fucking uncomfortable, like I said, being surrounded by all of these different beefs. It got to a point where I said, you know what? I can't even focus on trying to watch this award show. Let me just turn my fucking chair sideways. So I turned my chair around and was basically, you know, <laughs> looking at the guys hands on, like, you know, what what's this gonna be type of situation? Because I was expecting something, you know, and, Around that time was when me and Banks were supposed to present the next award, I think a Lifetime Achievement Award, the Snoop Dogg type of thing. And we were called to the back of the stage to be able to come out after Snoop walked off the stage, if I ain't mistaken. We were supposed to come out and present and say our piece. And being in the back of the stage, you know, you have to look at the teleprompter and know on your wait on your cue to walk out. And at that time, man, that I just seen a whole brawl come up, come about on a teleprompter and then it just went kind of black. So I immediately told Banks, you know, come on, bro, let's, let's get up here to the front. You know what I mean? And when I walked out onto the stage, the first thing I seen was, uh, was Dre, man. You know what I'm saying? I, I wasn't even aware of whatever punch or the guy whoever walked up and hit Dre or however it went. I just seen Dre doing doing his shit, you know what I mean? Going for what he what, what he could, you know what I mean, at the time. But I just seen him getting down, you know what I mean, with a motherfucker. And I couldn't, I'm looking for 50, you know. I'm trying to find 50 more than anything. Like, well, big bro, there was so much commotion, bro, that I, I just said, you know what, fuck this shit, you know what I mean? Let me get out here and get off the stage and, and get to it with the gang, because that's how shit go. And in the midst, you know what I'm saying? I seen seen a motherfucker having Dre kind of in a fucked up position, like where Dre was handling this shit, but it's only so much you can do with a motherfucker, you know what I'm saying? That's your same size or bigger. And it's two, three of these motherfuckers. So I was shit, man, with and done anything that I had to do, you know? And uh, like I say, uh, after whatever went on, man, I had a fork in my hand, you know? And and I just okay. had- Okay, well, from, you know, I know people that were part of that event. For uh, sure. Suge wasn't invited to the Vibe Awards. He just kind of pushed his way past security. Oh yeah? And came in. I never know yeah, that. That's, that's what I heard. And uh, with Suge was Jimmy James Johnson, uh, who has some, you know, and I've, I've talked to Jimmy actually. Oh yeah? the situation. Yeah. And he apparently had some sort of issues with Dre already. Um, he approached Dre, asked for an autograph. When Dre said, I guess, decline, he ended up punching Dre in the back of the head. And then the whole brawl kind of ensued. Uh, tables started getting thrown and chairs and everything else like that. And you allegedly stabbed the guy in the chest with a knife. Allegedly. Yeah. I just know, man, I, I had a fork in my hand, bro. I picked up a I picked up a fork, you know what I'm saying? And and I was just holding a fork, bro, and 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 I threw the fork down, bro. And out of nowhere, you know what I'm saying, you know, by the time we was leaving the award show, they were saying, yo, you know what I'm saying? Y'all kill somebody out here. And I'm like, y'all kill somebody. What are y'all talking about? And they was like, yeah, bro, one of the G unit members killed somebody, a G whoop the whoop. And I'm like, nah, bro, with me, I had a fork. You know what I'm saying? But shit, man, I went back to 50 and told 50, you know what I'm saying? I needed to get up out of time real quick. You know what I'm saying? Because I had that fork and it was one of them things where, you know, I just felt like, let me get my ass on up out of here. But by the time I had landed from flying out that same night, 
I was getting a call, you know what I'm saying, saying that I was wanted for 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 attempted murder, you know what I'm saying, in, in that situation. And I had already made it back to Nashville, you know what I'm saying? And I'm thinking like, damn, bro, like, it ain't been 24 hours and I'm charged with this. How these people come up with this or what or what not? When, when I had a fork, you know what I'm saying? And I, I just kept telling them, man, it wasn't me. I had a fork, you know, type of thing. And as the trial and that whole case went on, you know what I mean? They end up sending a forensics audit, a forensics team inside of that venue. And I ain't gonna lie, man, LAPD, some bad motherfuckers. They found that 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 fork that I claimed and was saying that I had, I threw that motherfucker down. And they found it with my fingerprints on it. So with that, you know, it was kind of hard for them to basically convict me, especially with no weapon and whatever was getting used and all of that. It was more or less everybody saying I've done this because they seen me lunging at the guy, but they didn't see me do anything, you know, or have any kind of weapon that kind of coexisted with the whole thing about me stabbing the guy. So I was able to get that charge dropped from uh, an attempted murder to a, a simple assault. Right. You pled no contest to assault with a chance to produce bodily injury. There you go. And that was a felony? Uh, yeah. I think after, I, I was only given like three years of probation, unsupervised, okay. and after those three years, I was supposed to have it expunged. But that kind of played a part of what sent me to prison. Because, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. right, and we'll, we'll talk about we'll that get to that part. too yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay. But I remember, and I can't find the picture, but correct me if I'm wrong. At one point, I saw a picture of you in a t-shirt and on the shirt was a, a hand holding a knife and it said, don't make me do it. Yeah, that was, that was me playing off of the energy of what the fuck had just happened, bro. It was like, uh. Y'all want to say I done it, so don't make me do it for real. You know what I'm saying? For one of you motherfuckers, because, uh, you know, I, I had that right when I was actually fighting the case. I actually put that, that shirt on right before I went to court for the first time. Wait, you showed up in court with that shirt? Not at all. But I actually <laughs> wore the shirt probably the day before I had court. You know, my whole thing was, I mean, I had a fork, bro. You know, and if y'all gonna convict me of this knife, uh, of stabbing this guy, you know, you're gonna have to prove it. And that's 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 yeah, the, that's I, what it was. I actually found a picture of the shirt. Oh it's yeah, pretty crazy. I, I I actually found it. How did I not like know that? It, it was a, it was a serrated knife at that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you're crazy, man. No, All right, you crazy? Wow, <laughs> bro, that's dope, bro. So. Because of that stabbing incident, uh, they kind of cut some of the promotion of your album and so forth. And I think I remember uh, like people were taking some of your features off songs and, and everything else like that. I think Lil Scrappy had to take a you know um, you know your verse off his song because yeah. people weren't trying to play it or, or something. And it was it was a lot of drama around. It was man. It was just a lot of things where individuals didn't expect for me to actually, I think, beat the case or what or what not. So they started finding ways to work records and shit with, around me, kind of anticipating me on going to prison and shit and everything else. Uh, so yeah. yeah, I dealt with a few things like that where you had a few artists that was, uh, you know, uh, pulling me from different records and also that was around the time where the game separation started to happen right around that time as well. Right, because right afterwards, the game drops documentary. Mm -hmm. And as he's promoting the album and running around New York, and I remember I was literally was with him mm -hmm. during those days. And this one day that I was supposed to hang out with them and, and film and whatever, I ended up not making it for whatever reason. 
Uh, 50 Cent does an interview on Hot 97, and I think Flex asked, uh, you know, what was Game's role in G Unit, and he said, "There's no role at all. He's kicked out." Yeah. Uh, Game and his crew were literally, I think, down the street or, or nearby in New York. They go and approach Hot 97 to talk to 50. 50 security was in front, and they end up opening fire uh, on the crew. Uh, one of Game's friends got shot. I think in the leg or something. Yeah. Uh, New Jersey Devil, who I knew, who was sort of my guy in that group, yeah. he got grazed. And uh, at that point, you know, game and G Unit were completely over. It was done. And you just yeah. basically explained the situation. Uh, you know, I, to this day, I, I kind of forget and don't really know exactly why 50's reasons was for kicking game or, or whatever out of G Unit at that time. But yeah, I, I don't know if Game now had pulled up with whatever approach they was because we were actually still upstairs in the radio station, and then when shit. Oh, oh, you you were there when Fifty actually announced the game is kicked yeah, out. Yeah, man, we were in the radio station. Okay, so when you heard that, were you like, oh shit, where did this come from, or was it like, okay, I knew this was gonna happen. I did not know it was gonna happen. Mm. I didn't. You know, I was just like, whoa, shit. And then it was one of them things where, like you said, Game was in town, so Game immediately pulled up, I guess, for whatever reason. And shit jumped off the way where it jumped off. And from there, uh, that's when the whole separation of Game and G-Unit started to come about. He started to create these disc records. We started to create disc records. My loyalty was to G Unit and to 50. And, uh, you know, Game's approach was fuck all y'all, I think, <laughs> at that point. You know what I'm saying? Especially bullets and shit had started flying and motherfuckers that got hit and shit like that. So, you know, that's what kind of started off the whole separation of the crew from the very beginning of that i i kind of think 50 you know had a problem in regards to the business of what was going on with the game in his situation whether it resolved around 50 dre and jimmy or whatever the case i, I just couldn't tell you honestly okay and like you said game started dissing you guys like when he did 300 bars, you got mentioned. Of course. And then you responded with, I think, Real Bitch Boy. I probably said a few things, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, I'm sure he said a few things as well, but yeah, that's what it was. It was a back and forth thing, you know what I mean? And we got to a point where me and Game almost had a standoff in Vegas. Yeah, during All-Star Weekend. During All-Star Weekend, it was me and Jeezy together. It's the first time me and Game had been in the same place as each other. You know, game, Game's a real one. And, you know, I'm a real one myself. So it was one of them situations where people were so intense and looking for something to happen. And it was a good chance it would happen. So I think I had grabbed the mic and said some shit like, you know what I mean? Because he was in the same building up there. And I, I probably had told some shit to Game like, you know, where you at, motherfucker? What you know? Let's get straight to it. Looked up and game was making his way down the goddamn steps to get to it. You know what I mean? He, it ain't. What I'm saying is that, you know, ain't no bitching dude blood. He was, you know, even though I was giving that energy off, he was there for it as well. You know what I'm saying? It just didn't get to the point where we became physical with each other. But we both was looking for that. I think at the time we're preparing ourselves for that. I was prepared for it and still is to this day. That's just a part of being who you are in a sense. So it was one of them things where, you know, I felt like, damn, I'm finally right here with homie. He done said this about, about me and everything. And and I, I'm sure he felt the same. I'm right here with this nigga. And he done said this about me, you know? So that whole, that whole shit was just based on me inheriting the loyalness to 50s beef on my end and doing what anybody who's a part of a crew loyal to the loyal to a crew and standing with that crew through thick and thin. You understand what I'm saying? Whether we was, you know, I never took the time 
I fought myself for that today because I never took the time to know what I was actually beefing with that man for. You understand mm. what I'm saying? And even now, I don't I don't even know the true facts of what the fuck I was even beefing with him for. No different than Fat Joe or any one of these dudes. You know, I found myself in Chicago one time with a situation with Fat Joe and me and him end up really having real words and it, it almost got into a real fucked up situation. And, you know, he stood his ground. You know, Fat Joe ain't got no bitch in his blood or none of that shit. So it wasn't like I was pushing a line at these dudes and these dudes running like bitches and shit like that. You know, Fat Joe, <laughs> Fat Joe like, what's up, motherfucker? Let's do it. And I'm like, well, motherfucker, let's go, you know, type of shit. And police get all in the middle in between of the shit and all that good shit. So, you know, I was one of them ones where, you know, 50 would throw these rocks at these individuals through his music. And in a sense, you know, I'm, having an album out left to promote, shows to go do. So I was quicker to run into these individuals that we quote unquote had problems with before him. So I dealt with a lot of that. The Get Rich or Die Trying movie soundtrack comes out. You're on that, that goes platinum. Mm -hmm. And then your second album comes out, Buck the World. Uh, Get Buck, very dope song, by the way. Uh, Paul the Don did that beat. Word, shout out to Polo the Don. Polo the Don is a fucking architect. He oh, built yeah. he built that shit, that record right there. He plays so many different parts, like young, buck, young. That's Polo. People didn't know it, mm. but he was the first one to ever introduce me to the whole talk box instrumental. He just was in a whole nother world. And then you know, from as a produ- producer. So I owe a lot of that get book record to Polo the Don, for sure. Yep. Uh, that album goes gold. So it does well, but not as well as your previous album. Without a doubt. Now, did the problems with 50 kind of start after that? It started with that project. Because what happened was Shot Money and 50 started to have their problems in the midst of me making the Buck the World album. Um, they issues was, from my understanding, about money, you know? And 50 immediately started to bring me and the guys together in the rooms at the office and say things like, well, look, y'all gonna have to find another manager. You know, at the time, Shaw was the president of the company, the manager of me, Bank San Yeo. He wore so many fucking different hats, bro the producer, he did everything. He's producing tracks, he's the president of the company, he's the manager. And then all of a sudden him and 50 stopped seeing eye to eye for whatever reasons, which put me in a position where I had to make a decision on whether I'm gonna continue with him being my manager or not when 50 just told all of us that we needed to go find new management because he's cutting his ties with Sha. I just dropped Buck the World. Not only that, this is the only manager I know. Not only that, Sha Money had became a best friend of mine. I'm the best man on this man's wedding. That's how many close Sha was. Me and Sha were fucking probably closer than me and 50. Him and 50 was. You know, so I'm the best man of this man wedding. I'm judging Shy not from a business standpoint of his problems with 50, but looking at him as, as my brother. No different than I think 50 was. And I didn't know their situations was that serious to the point where I needed to fire Shy. So Banks and Yayo carried that out, but I didn't. And when I didn't, that's what started everything. The resentment started from 50 not having me on the shows together. So you would see Banks and Yayo and 50 together. Me and Sha were left to promote that project on our own. That's why a lot of that project didn't do as well as the first one because Sha was going through his issues with 50. I've made the decision to stay with Sha. Now 50's treating me like an outcast to the group. 
Oh, you over there with him and leaving whatever it was to be done on me and Shy to get done. So from there uh, is when, you know, I was started to get questioning interviews and shit about, you know, uh, well, what's going up? What's up with you and, and, and G-Unit? You know, 50 was here. Why you're not there? Or this is that. And for a long time, I used to put a mask over the shit. Oh, man, they we all got different schedules and shit like that. You know, but after a while, bro, it became a point where it was beginning so intense of how he was treating me and Shy at that time from the separation that, you know, I was getting asked questions uh, about, you know, uh, things like, you know, uh, publishing and, and monies and royalties and shit like that. And then I was answering those questions from the best of my knowledge. And and it was like, man, I ain't never seen a, a publishing check. Everything I got come from shows and shit like that. Them facts from what I knew of my career. Because technically, you know, I, I, I wasn't aware of or wasn't receiving some of the things that these people were looking at me as an artist to say, this is why I have all of this materialistic shit. I was bigging myself up from the facts of where they stood at, the, at that time. Was like, no, nah, I did this on my own. You know what I'm saying? But I always maintain keeping 50 in that light based on the opportunity that he gave me. I feel like none of it would been able for me to accomplish. So that's why you would hear those lines like, uh, I got a Bentley that I only drove one time, 50 bought it for me, shorty, but it's still mine. I bought that fucking Bentley my goddamn self, but 50 gave me the opportunity to be able to buy it. So it was one of those yeah. things, you know, where I just started to experience a lot of the resentment from him by staying a part of shy money you understand? And staying with Shot Money as my manager and as my brother, taking that sacrifice, in my mind, I'm thinking they're going to work this shit out and everything will be just fine. You know what I'm saying? But I'm not going to turn my on my brother when I had no beef with Sha or no problems in business at the time to just walk away from him. And I got a whole album and project left to promote. I can't go find no other manager. And it wasn't like 50 was bringing nobody else in to become that to us, neither. It was just get rid of shot. Well, I think around that time, 50 got to cash out on that vitamin water deal. Mm -hmm. And the first time I heard some level of friction with, with you and G Unit was I think you had made a comment on stage like, I didn't get any any of that money from the vitamin water deal, so I gotta hustle my own money or, or something like that. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know, it's the truth. Um, you know, 50 encouraged us. Well, look, I would have all these different deals come back to me at the time. All right. You had different deals like we, we had the Reebok sneaker deal. He started to pull these deals from us over shit like, oh, y'all not wearing the shoes. And I'm thinking... Okay, we rock these shoes, but damn, we got to wear them every day of our life. It's not a part of the contract saying wear them every day of our life, but, you know, we kept the shoes on. It's our own brand. But he felt personally, if we ain't wearing the shoes, let me take this $250,000 that y'all getting from this every, you know, whatever the case. So he started doing shit like that. You understand? And I started... I would bring back every opportunity that come my way. Of course, I got to bring it to the CEO, which is him. Like, yo, Phil, what about this deal? What about that? So, you know, the vitamin water situation was a, was a situation where I remember it coming through the pipelines. And I remember me also coming to 50 saying, hey, yo, what about this? And... He would pay attention to him, but if it wasn't no upfront money involved in the deals, then he wouldn't encourage us to do the deals. And the vitamin water deal was exactly kind of that way where, you know, there was opportunity where I think we all could have been a part of that deal, but it wasn't no upfront money there for us. So he took the deal 
for him and whatever percentage he got out of that deal turned into what he was able to walk away from. Was there any resentment or upsetness for me? Nah, but I did feel like, you know, this this no different than some of these other situations that been brought to 50 from me and even the other guys had other situations where he just wasn't entertaining it if it wasn't any upfront money with us. And he did a situation that wasn't no upfront money, but then what, be, becoming one of the most lucrative deals in his career that he done. And I seen that opportunity there for me, Banks, Yale, and even Gang at the time. But it was one of those situations where, you know, it was kind of his way or no way type of thing. It's kind of how he carried out the G-Unit brand and, and running shit. You know, it was more, if you spoke your mind or whatever, you became an outcast. And I was never good with that. And I was the one that was separated through, through, through 50 because, you know, I mean, we're through the other guys and shit like that because, you know, shit, I'm gonna speak my mind. You know, I'm no different than you. You's a man just like me. You put your pants on the same way I do. You bleed the same way I do. So I never feared of being able to tell 50 how I truly felt, whether he was right or wrong. You understand? And that established what I thought more of a bond that I had with 50 than, than the, all the other guys. Because, you know, he knew I was a very respected individual throughout the South period. You know what I'm saying? Before I became a part of G-Unit, you know, I was respected in the streets first. I come from the street. So being in, put in that position of, you know, being this respected individual because of the life I lived throughout the streets before I became what I became with him, it didn't change the mentality of who I am as a person. It made it more, more, more useful for him as well because he was able to kind of grab the South and grab the whole, uh, the whole realness that came along with me as well by being that member of the group that didn't grow up with him or come from where they came from. And my ties was just as strong, you know, as they are in the South as it is on the West Coast as well. So, you know, I brought a lot to G-Unit outside of just being the artist and being a good, you know, a good artist and good at what I do as far as making music. Well, around that time, it seemed like things started to go bad between you and 50, and he ended up releasing a personal phone call that you guys had where it sounded like you were crying or getting emotional or whatever else. And he doubt. ended up releasing that to the world to make you look bad. Without which a... uh, I, I didn't think was cool. You know, I, I don't like, you know, I've had, I've had myself, you know, recorded and, and put out and shit Bro. like that. And I always thought that was foul. Yeah, so it was. When you saw that he had released that, what'd you think? It fucked me up, bro, honestly, because I looked at 50 as a big brother and I did become emotional on that phone call. But there's nothing wrong with crying. Every real man shed tears. That don't make you pussy because you become emotional on a conversation with your brother or whatever the case. So I never felt that energy from that part. I just felt fucked up from him trying to play me pussy from some shit like that. You know, my thing was that how that phone call came about is what the world is about to hear now. And that's what fucked me up the more than anything. And what, what fucked me up the most was I was with Shaw Money when I made that phone call. Me and Shaw Money had been out struggling in a sense of trying to get this project to go as far as it can, meaning to buck the world. The resentment was being shown, you know, crazy throughout the uh, throughout uh, the way he was treating me and Shy and business and communications and everything. It was almost a whole year had went by and we hadn't been around each other or even seen them. It was me and Shaw, Banks, Yale, and Fifth. So here it is one day in Phoenix, Arizona. Shaw tells me, yo, bro, we got to put an end to this shit, bro. We got to get on the phone with Fifth, bro, and get this shit right. And I'm like, 
Man, get him on the phone, Shaw, bro. You understand what I'm saying? And when he got him on the phone, you know what I'm saying? You know, the phone call that you hear that was recorded was actually me talking on the phone with Shaw Money right beside me in the van in Phoenix, Arizona at the time. And, uh, you know, I, I, had, I hadn't spoken to 50, hadn't seen him. That was my brother. I'm used to being amongst my brothers every day. We, we, we you know, fight, play, laugh, cry together, whatever the case may be, that was my brother. So when, in that phone call, I was only telling him, you know, you know, bro, you know, we got to get this shit back together, bro. I, you know, I think I had said something in that conversation along the lines where, you know, uh, how, how I was voicing how I, you know, wanted to be back together and back a part of what we had once started. But if you fast forward and go to the very end of the conversation, it's the key. The last words that out of that conversation, 50 said was, okay, man, we're going to get it together. We got, we, we, we about to get this together. We, we, we about to get it right. Let's do it. Man, that was one of the best conversations that I felt in my heart that I actually had with my brother. Even though as emotional as it was, it was almost a year of not being around 50, speaking to 50, any of that. And here it is. He agreed and was like, bro, let's get it together. Not only was it a good conversation for me, but it was a good conversation for Shaw Money as well. Because him and Shaw Money was even able to uh, kind of speak and kind of have their peace, I think, from that conversation. Not during that conversation, it was my conversation with 50, but then they started to get back in place with each other. And when 50's last words out of that conversation was, okay, we're gonna get it right. Well, that's what we started to do. Now we're back in the loop. We're back in the office. We're back around each other. Everything started rolling right. Everything. Everything started looking like it was supposed to be then. Now we're back together. Now I'm a part of the shows again. You know, now I'm doing my thing the way that I always wanted it to be. You get what I'm saying? And um, we were six months into the situation, probably of getting back together. And out of nowhere, this interview comes out. I forget who and what, you know, platform it, it, it extends from, but it was one of those interviews where prior to us getting back together, I had spoke on me not receiving any publishing or, you know, what I just spoke on about me, you know, never seeing a, a royalty check in my career, bro. Everything I done done, it's been off shows and shit like that. Well, that was the big and bold headlines of what the platform pushed that story out on. And then it comes across 50's desk. And he immediately took this from a land, a, 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 a place of, to this day, I know why now, but at the time he, he reacted to that so fucked up that Shaw Money was like, yo, we gotta fix this, bro. 50's tripping out over this. And I'm like, Shaw, what, how can I fix it? It's the truth, I ain't never seen a royalty chick. Like, he's like, yeah, I know, but you know, we gotta fix it, everything's right. We can't go back to this bullshit, Buck. So, you know, that's when I think Shaw Money goes out and says, Buck's made over $10 million in his career. You understand what I'm saying? He was just saying these numbers of quote unquote that I thought was astronomical. Man, I ain't seen no fucking $10 million. Even though that's probably what I later to find out, I shoulda, they were quoting the numbers that were there for me, but I never seen those numbers. So it was one of them things where here it is, I'm speaking facts and he's clearing it up by saying I've made over $10 million in my career. And then 50 starts grabbing that $10 million line and even holds on to it today. I think is if I've made all of this money out of my career and blowed all my money and all of a sudden I don't have anything. That's one of his, one of his things into getting to the people and pushing this, I've done this and, 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 and he's made all of these money and they blow, blow this and whatever the fact may be out of that is, no, 
I never received or made $10 million within my career with G-Unit. Those were numbers that were basically accumulated from Shy Money trying to protect the situation from him having an actual fit based on me speaking about me not seeing money like that or ever receiving a royalty check. Um, you know, from there, 50 didn't feel like the effort was, or, or that was good enough. So following probably a week from, I think, or a couple days even from when Shy was even trying to help clear the situation up, you know, 50 goes again on Hot 97, one of the biggest platforms in the world and radio wise and goes and immediately says, you know, Buck's kicked out of G-Uni. I have to find out from somebody that's around me, like, yo, bro, you know, 50's on the radio up here kicking you out the crew. I'm like, what? Nah, y'all crazy. Everything's all good. You know, I never know that it was that that crazy. So soon he kicked me out, I'm like, what the fuck is this about? And then he started to say, oh, because, you know, I'm, I'm cool with game or, you know, those different things started to happen. Like I'm cool with the enemies of him or I'm, I, I've am i rocked with the enemies of him. And it wasn't that, it was that I'm active. So I would run into a few of these individuals, the Jim Jones, all right, the Dipset individuals, the Jada Kisses when we had these beefs or whatever, you know, or even game or whatever. And you know what they would get, what I would get from these dudes? Bro, we fuck with you, we just don't fuck with dude. You understand what I'm saying? Those was one of those things where it's kind of hard for you to have a problem with somebody who genuinely ain't got a problem with you, but may quote unquote have a problem with your brother. Now this is my brother, so not that I, I didn't, uh, you know, go and become friends with these dudes. But what I would do was come back and relay it to 50. Yo, bro, I run into homie. Homie now ain't really want no smoke like that or tripping off or nothing like that. You know, I actually said, you know, they fuck with me. They just got a problem with you about whatever the case may be. And I guess that's what gave him feeling like, you know, oh, I'm cool with these dudes or whatever. What, because everything I did, I kind of brought it to 50's attention, period, before any, anything, especially any kind of action or some shit like that. So, you know, from there I started to realize that I'm out of the fucking group. It started to really happen and really set in on me uh, once the IRS started knocking at my door looking for, I forget how much money it was that I owed at that time it was a few hundred thousand, though. It was no millions or nothing. But yeah, it was uh it was three hundred thousand. Three hundred thousand. Yeah. But what was odd was that I never filed my own taxes or none of that in my life. My business manager was his business manager. You know, it was set up. Now I'm very clear of the business, very off into the business, love the business, because I understand it and I know where I went wrong at in regards to my own business. But it's nothing like, quote unquote, 50 tends to give to the world. You know, my tax debt became me having to deal with the first tax situation in my career was based on the fact of, you know, uh, his attorney was Theo Sotomayor at the time. Our attorney was Hector Balinado. Hector Balinado was hired and given to us through his attorney. So it was one of these umbrellas that went on. Uh, Bruce Seckendorf was the... Uh, was the business management business manager at the time. That was 50's business manager at the time. What I'm saying is he controlled everything. So when we had our falling out, he just goes and tells Bruce to stop working for me, which I've never filed my own taxes. That's what I pay business management for. But he stopped that, which allowed these taxes to accumulate, didn't get filed. And next thing you know, IRS beating down my door saying you owe this. And I'm like, what the fuck? I don't even know that. I don't know what, what you know, what the fuck to kind of do at the time because I never fucking even was 
man, I don't blame them because it's up to every artist to do their own education behind anybody's education. I know it now, but that's why right. I kind of slipped up on what's the business on my situation with 50. And uh, from that, I was left with this tax debt, which led to me not being able to pay the debt at the time because I'm no longer part of G Unit. And then out of nowhere, he drops this phone call. All right, in the midst of me going through having to file bankrupts and all of this shit, here he comes with this infamous quote unquote phone call where I became emotional at. And then almost appears to the world as if I'm crying to be a part of G Unit in the midst of me going through what I was going through. The world never know that this was pre-recorded from this man and held on for whatever reasons. And then he used it to drop it, you know, on a platform to make it seem, you know, like it was recent when he pre-recorded that call and just probably felt like now's the time for me to put this out right where he's you know, going through his issues because, like I say, he's a very strategic, smart dude when it comes to a lot of different areas and dealing with trying to fuck over people's lives and shit like that. I've I've learned a lot of that shit from him. He he's very strategic in 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 the way he does things a lot of times and shit like that. But that's how that whole phone uh phone call was released. It wasn't a situation where uh I became emotional with 50 and in the midst of that time that it was released, it was a phone call that he had pre-recorded it. And way before the issues came about, he dropped the phone call and people tend to, you know, go off the only thing or what they know or what they see. So that was pushed out there in the middle of the bankruptcy. So I was kind of fighting that situation of, you know, the whole emotional thing. Uh, and then at the same time, fighting the, the the bankruptcy and, you know, that led into them actual coming into my home to seize things in, in my home to use to pay my actual tax debt. And in the midst of them uh, in my home to seize TVs, my kids' shit and all kind of shit, everything that they seen was an asset, you know, Uncle Sam wanted to get his. Right. Well, because, I mean, people owe money in taxes. People get audited. I mean, I've been audited. Uh, but you actually had the IRS raid your home in Nashville. Yep. Over, over this money owed, which is crazy to me. Like, I've never heard of a raid over, over a tax debt. In the process of that raid, authorities found a 40 caliber uh, Glock 22 and a bunch of ammunition. And I guess since you were a felon, based on the Vibe Awards uh, situation, now you are, you know, you're prohibited from owning firearms. So now this whole IRS thing has a gun charge on top of it. There you go, Vlad. And um, that's exactly what happened. They found this, this, this 40, 40 Glock in my home during the IRS raid from taking things out of my home. When they first found the gun, I looked and they, they was like, well, whose is this? And I said, that's my tour manager's gun, which it was. He, he's licensed to carry, you know. I guess he had left it in one of the rooms or whatnot, but it was his weapon. And I didn't have no problem with telling him, yo, whose it is, because like I say, he's licensed to carry the gun. That was his gun. And it was nothing to them. They kept the gun and took it with them. Eight months later, I get indicted from the from the federal government on felon in possession of a firearm, and they found one bullet in my home as well that didn't match none of the guns or none of that, not even the gun that they found, but they charged me with felon in possession of, of ammunition. Now, technically, shit, I'm one that kind of escaped through with as far as being a part of these streets in every kind of fucking way. I was blessed to the point where I never had no fucked up, uh, no record, or no even no felonies on my shit like that. I wasn't no 
back and forth to jail type of motherfucker like that. You know, I, I do what I do and did what I did in the streets and I'm just blessed to be able to sit here and, you know, speak the way I speak and at the same time not have that criminal history or background to go along with my shit like a lot of these dudes possibly do. But that was the only felony that I had at my record at the time was from LA, you understand, and the incident of the whole Vibe Awards thing. And like I said, I was given three years of unsupervised probation. My lawyer at the time, it was six years after the Vibe Awards had happened when this happened. So for us, we looked at it as if, okay, cool. Let's just go out here, get this expunged, because technically we thought the felony was already expunged because after three years, that was a part of my deal was after the probation is over, then they go get it expunged and I'm done with the situation. Well, we didn't follow up with the lawyer. So on my record, technically it read as a felony. That's why they were able to charge me. Once I got the charge, I had the same attorney that represented me in the case, go and get the charge expunged. So before I went to court here, federal court, in regards to the gun, I didn't have a felony. It was technically no felony, no felony at all on my record, but the judge, the judge was like, well, you was a felon at the time you caught the charge, I'm going forward with the case. Even mm. though I done went out here and got it expunged, I'm, I play a part of the politics of this city that I'm in. It's almost like being a big fish in a small pond in a sense. And these people, a lot uh, that I've been through has been based off of the picture that's painted of Buck. And I realize it's a picture that I helped paint, but I'm not responsible for for the wrongdoing that's been done to me throughout my life in regards to dealing with the criminal side of things. And that's the first situation. You know, my attorney at the time is now the head district attorney of this whole city now. And shout out to him because he represented me very well in my eyes in the case by getting me the time that I did get it. I think I walked away with an 18 month sentence. I had to fight for right. that. You know, I had to fight for to, to get in that sentence and I was sentenced off to Yazoo Federal Penitentiary. You know, um, the politics of this city is what I feel like I feel a victim of more than anything. I think it was a situation where it was around election time in regards to attorneys and, and DAs and different individuals needing this person's vote and this person's likeness. And I give you this case and you give me what you need type of thing. I'm not sure, but I'm almost sure that's how it played out because, you know, my conviction was, was, was crazy to me because technically I wasn't even a felon when I went forward with the case. But I also dealt with a, a very notorious DA in this city to this very day. A very, very foul, very notorious DA in this city that has, I won't say has it out for me, but basically has done a lot of different things involved with a lot of different individuals' cases out here where I would say you know, a lot of it is not following the law. It's just by following the power that they're given. So for me, you know, I fell a victim to that situation where I found myself a full-fledged celebrity sitting in a federal prison with guys that's got 25 years and 10 years and 30, 40 years, 50 years, and I'm sitting in here with an 18 month sentence. I wouldn't dare even speak on the time that I had in, in prison because it was so fucking unheard of from where I was at based on the time around. I, I'm in prison with guys that I grew up with as a child that's been in prison mm. with 22 and 25 years sentence. And I found myself right here beside them. 
you know, as a full-fledged celebrity. And I don't believe in doing no PC time. So I walked the yard like anybody else, any other real one, when it came to going, prison, going to prison and, and that experience as well. Well, before you turn yourself into prison uh, for 18 months, there was a drive-by shooting. Without a doubt. Yeah. I guess, uh, was it an argument in a club and the guys ended up shooting your car up afterwards? Yeah, well, it was it was definitely an argument in a club. You know, one of, it was a situation with a dude and the God bless the dead. I don't know. Something happened to them dudes that that that, that happened to as well that, that done that situation too. Um, you know... I, I'm in the club at, at that time, you know what I'm saying? And uh, my kid's mother, two of my daughter's mother, she was with me. And uh, I think we were trying to move through through the crowd or what or not. One of the guys ended up grabbing her, and all of that old shit. And I'm like, hold on, homie, chill. You know what I mean? That's that's my old lady. And it, it turned into a fuck you and your old lady type of thing. And I'm like, what? And, and you know, eventually, you know, somebody do that, you know, I haul off and hit him in his motherfucking mouth, Vlad, just to be as solid as I can with you. You know, and that stemmed to me getting rushed out of the club. When I got rushed out of the club, I get in my vehicle with a few of my guys. We're making our way on throughout the city to head home and shit. I get on the interstate and I hear pink, pink, pink. And I could see the fire coming from the car. So I kind of knew what the car was and shit. And uh, I just grabbed my old lady at that time, man, and pushed her down. She got hit, you know what I'm saying? And I pushed her down on the ground and was kind of driving with one arm and she screaming and hollering and shit and windows and shit flying. And, you know, they, they really made a good attempt for it, you know? And from there, you know, that whole shooting situation was a, it was a fucked up situation. And, Thank God I made it through it. I end up, uh, she she ended up being all right. She she didn't take the full impact of the bullet. It went kind of in and right out type of thing. So she was even all right out of it. And uh, you know, guys who done that, you know, end up, you know, end up coming up dead or what or whatnot. So. And I don't know how that shit happened. Just like you said in the beginning, it's like. People do things and you can't just be shooting at people cars and shit like that. So I don't know. I guess karma came back to them for whatever it was worth. And, you know, they end yeah. up, you know, the actual dude. Yeah, they end up getting killed some kind of way. I, I don't even know how that shit happened or what or what not. Yep. Like you said, karma. It is what it is. It is what it is. So, yeah, I done had a pretty interesting story, bro. So you do your 18 months, you get out in October of 2013. And then in 2014, uh, Hot 97 has their summer jam and you end up on stage with 50 and G-Unit, with 50 Lloyd Banks and Tony Yayo. And then it was confirmed that G-Unit is back together, uh, Kid Kid was the newest member, and now, you know, G unit is reunited, except for game, of course. Yeah. Uh, and you guys start working on a music together. Right. Uh what, what led to you guys getting back together? A phone call from Shot Money for me. Um mm. uh, No, a phone call from Who Kid. Who Kid play a big part into my whole G-Unit reunion side of thing. I think Who Kid was pushing 50 and telling 50, yo, you gotta get them back together, bro. We gotta get back together type of thing. And uh, I wanted to be back, a, a, you know, back a part of the team. I've always had this, this kind of soft spot in my heart for G-Unit in a sense. That's what I feel like I was kind of breeded from on a worldwide basis in a sense, like, no matter what I've been through, though, I can never take the fact the way that the 50 gave me that opportunity. And even though he didn't hand me my success, because I, I took advantage of the opportunity that he was given, that, that was given to me. But I always had this loyalty to G-Unit. So, you know, when 
who kid brought it out, brought it back to me like, yo, you know, I think 50 wants to get the crew back together. How you feel? It's like, even though I done been through all of this shit, the phone calls, all of this foul ass shit that I know that's been done to me in regards to 50 and, and the business of the of G-Unit and everything, I still took it in my soul and followed what God was giving me to say, okay, get this another try. And at the time, Shot Money was away from them. And, and he was still kind of on my line in a sense where we were still speaking. And honestly, I don't think Shot felt too good about me going back because he kind of seen the situation of me uh, playing out more with him. But once I realized 50 had pushed the line for me to become uh, back a part of G-Unit, that's, that's exactly what I did. Um, so you were saying Shaw Money was a little yeah. hesitant about- uh, About me. Come back? Right. Shaw Money was a little hesitant about me coming back because he felt like, uh, you know, it's, it's not genuine type of thing, I think, more than anything. But I was making it in my own decisions and I wanted to be back amongst my brothers. And that's what it was. And, I definitely uh, from there went to uh, flew from from my city back out to New York, and our first appearances that we had together was like you said at the Hot ninety seven thing, uh, where we we come back out to uh, you know give the world G unit one more time, and from there uh, fifty started to. Uh, create a brand new situation contractual wise because I was no longer under the contract of my previous years. So I was coming into him uh, basically giving the opportunity of creating, uh, I think uh, we were supposed to do a group project and one solo project. And uh, we released a few EPs amongst that time and from there, it was supposed to lead off into a, into a solo projects or either a group project. I know we wasn't, it wasn't a full G Unit album ever getting, ever put back together since that reunion came. It was only a few EPs that would drop. And um, in the midst of that contract, he, I think, signed everybody else to a, to a group album deal, but for me, he put a group album deal and a solo album situation in there. So technically the two gotcha. EPs counted as a group album, but I was left to in the entitled to fulfill an album agreement where he slid that in within getting a solo project out of me. And um, that's what's leading up to where we at today in the business of the problems that started to occur. Cause from there, um, it's when everything just started going haywire, bro. Yeah. Well, I mean, that happened in 2014. You, uh, you get back with G-Unit, you guys drop a couple of uh, projects. Uh, like you said, um, this was the beast is G-Unit. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as um, Beauty of Independence. Beauty of Independence. So you guys dropped a couple projects. Seems like you guys were cool again. Mm -hmm. In 2016, you had a situation where you uh, kicked down your ex-girlfriend's right. door um, and got arrested. Yeah, and sent back to prison. And that played yeah. that that played out again within that 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 DA that I kind of spoke on. In regards to that, you know, it was one of those situations where, you know, I was in a relationship. We had a a bad argument based on, you know, money that I had in the home. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I wanted to get my money and she felt a certain way. And I was like, nah, you're going to open that door and let me get what belongs to me. You know what I'm saying? A large sum of money. And, you know, I ended up becoming a little irate, kicking the door. And I never stepped foot in the house. 
Because once the door came open, she just threw the bag outside. It was like, you know, but even out of that situation, I kind of regret it because, you know, she had her children there and, sh and shit like that, bro. And it was just me becoming irate. And I, and, and I could have avoided that, you know, honestly. So yeah. out of that, she she became so irate where the police got involved. And, uh, you know, once my name was... Uh, coming across those airwaves, I was still on federal probation at the time. And, you know, the DA immediately targeted that as a way of sending me back to prison. And that's exactly what he did. You know, I find myself on the way back to the same prison, but a higher level of prison. Now I'm headed back to Yazoo Federal Penitentiary, but to the medium yard where he basically added some charge that I literally just found out about not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago, in a bond hearing out here. And uh, I'm like, what the chart? What's the name of that? Chart? Where'd that come from? And I realized that this man basically had to add a charge on to me in order to jack these points up and send me to a medium yard. Now I'm actually going back to prison in a, in a high level prison. I went from being in a low, in an open dorm to now I'm in a medium behind the door. But I'm in prison now with a year sentence. But now I'm in here with everybody that got 80 years, 40 years, 30 years, you know, and one of the most livest, rockingest prisons and federal prisons that you could be in, Yazoo, you know, with the same penitentiary number, 20669075, just walking a different yard. Niggas like, man, you back? You know, cause it was niggas that, I had done time in the low, they done fucked up and made their way up to the medium now. They're like, what the fuck you doing in here? So I literally spent three months in transit, you know, just to get to that penitentiary. So technically I was only in the penitentiary for maybe eight months, seven, eight months type of thing. It wasn't, it wasn't a long thing before I was right back at the right back at the halfway house, you know what I'm saying? And um, that's, 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 that's how that went. So you end up doing seven months in prison altogether? Yeah, it was maybe a little bit longer than that, but yeah, yeah, about that, yeah, about that not, much. Not a full year. It wasn't a full year because he gave me a, yeah. a offer to go back and kill my probation in a sense. And I was with that. I think I still had two, two or more years left of probation but me going back to prison uh, killed those years of probation. And I was yeah. failing drug tests and so on and forth throughout my federal probation. So, you know, that was in a sense a blessing to be able to come home and be totally free from anything. Well, 2018, uh, a video came out uh, with a transgender and people were saying that it was you. Uh, you denied it. You said, let me go on and address this real fast, real quick. Ain't shit gay about me. I ain't got no problem with no gay people. Whatever the fuck you dudes, you know, thought you seen on the tape, that ain't no motherfucking tape and no motherfucking punk sucking my dick. Facts. Uh, the, the transgender person, uh, Glamour Perfect, ended up uh, apologizing. She said, uh, first I'd like to start to, by apologizing to, to David, AKA Young Buck, his family, friends, anyone who has been uh, offended or hurt by the video that was recently posted on my page. Uh, but you know, this became a, a media circus. Without a doubt. And it's crazy because uh, when this shit first happened, man, just to be as honest with you, it fucked me up like it would fuck anybody up. You understand what I'm saying? And for me, it was one of them situations where I reacted not even seeing the video first because I know where I stand at. Like I say, I ain't got a problem with them people. That wasn't me. But when I seen the fucking video, I said, damn, that is me in that fucking video. But it wasn't me knowingly going into a situation knowing that this is what the fuck it was. It was one of those things where, you know, I was catfished out of some shit. You understand what I'm saying? Pretty much where a person was in these DMs and sending pussy squirting all over the room and pop up and say, hey, I'm in your city. And me at the time thinking with my dick, I 
smash over there thinking I'm finna smash on this bitch and walk in the situation. It wasn't even me knowing what the person was at the time. It was me feeling like, hold on, this is a fucking robbery or setup because when I realized, hold on, that ain't the same motherfucker that's been on this video, I immediately got the fuck out of the room, okay? So from there, that's when I guess the motherfucker was, it's clearly a situation where they were using it to try to set me up for whatever reasons or whatever they was trying to do because when I seen the shit, I could see the way the camera angles and shit was set up, but there was nothing that came from that. It was me getting out of the room, honestly thinking that it was a fucking setup from a bitch because nothing came from it. I approached the situation like, hey, put this motherfucker in your mouth because from the understanding of what it was throughout these DMs and texts at that time was, I'm on my period. So I was basically coming in looking for the goddamn head out the bitch, but it ended up not being a fucking bitch and I end up not getting no fucking head from this motherfucker in no kind of way. So for me, you know, dealing with the whole gay shit or whatever, I honestly, the shit don't fuck with me now, but it fucked with me at the time because you know, if that's what I was, or what I chose to be, so be it. Fuck y'all. You know what I mean? And fuck how you feel. But the fact that it wasn't and it's not what the fuck I am and who the fuck I am, it, it kind of drove me in a place of trying to fight public opinion. And I realized I'm never going to win in that world. So I let go and let God at that point. And it is what the fuck it is out of that, man. Yeah, and Fifty Cent obviously chimed in. Of course, you know he That's did. What he he does. did some Instagram posts and, and, and everything else like that about it, of uh, course. which is what he does. I mean, shouldn't it, be any surprise. It, well, it gave him leverage to kind of mask on what our real issues was about because we were having issues at that time in regards of Sound Exchange, a company that pays out the royalties on this music. I'm sure you're aware of it, and a lot of people are. They have reached mm -hmm. out to Fifty and told 50 that going forward, I was gonna receive my own 33 and a third percent. They had three years of checks that hadn't been cast since 2015, all right? They were wondering and reaching out to me, why did I stop cashing these checks? I tell them, what checks? I don't know nothing about these checks. Well, they said, well, we've been sending them to you since we existed in 2007. I'm like, huh? I've never cashed one of these checks. Six figure fucking check. Okay. I'm, I'm more or less like, what the hell is going on here? You feel what I'm saying? So my attorneys tracked down the situation and realized that, you know, the checks were being sent to G Unit Incorporated or what or whatnot, which is 50 Cent's company. So, of course, I got those three years of checks right then and there. But then the question started to come about is, Where's all the other money? That, where did that go? So instead of me, you know, coming at a negative approach or what or whatnot, they were the ones that stressed out to 50 and let him know that going forward, they were going to see me my own checks. From that moment, 50 blocked me from Instagram. I'm sure his phone numbers as well and everything that the world sees now started to play out, you know, far as the whole beef or whatever thing that me and dude got going on. He used that shit that happened as a way to get a laugh and to mask all the business. Me and 50 had business issues. Nothing in regards to this bullshit ass, fake ass shit that he puts out there in, in regards to saying I'm gay, all of that shit. <laughs> It's, it's, it's wild, you know, but at the same time, like I told you before, 50 is very strategic when it comes to uh, dealing with these things and covering up his bullshit, you know, and this is just one of them situations in regards to uh, me and 50 where he, uh, he used that to mask the issues of what our situation was. And from there, he started to uh, send cease and desist out to uh, YouTube and iTunes and all of these different companies 
and stopping my wave of being able to make any kind of music because what he held on to is the solo record that I had signed for in 215 and saying that I'm under contract with him. At the time I tried to reach out and figure out, okay, let me turn in this album. Of course he denied it, you know, anything to basically prolong and quote unquote, try to fuck me over, which he'll soon realize that you can't stop God's plan. Like even now, you know, it's just one thing you can't do. And one of those things that I've realized out of this situation is that, uh, you know, I've paid more attention to the things I need to correct versus worrying about whatever the fuck 50's doing or saying at this point. Right, because I think it was last year, uh, someone approached you, I think, at a grocery store. You were with your girl. And yeah. You were talking all that trans yeah. stuff. And yeah. it started to escalate. At one point, you said, I got something in the car. Yeah, I had something wrong with it. I mean, I'm going I'm to keep it solid with it. It, it. And he, the individual that played that role, you know what I'm saying? Uh, he ain't nowhere to be found around throughout here. You know, it's kind of hard to, to, to play from that perspective with an individual like me and then expect for things to be easy for you. You know, it's just the, the, the aura and stereotype of what the shit that 50 brought or so brings to the table I'm kind of left to deal with. And some of that shit I may turn my nose and head and like, fuck you. But some of that shit I will entertain. I give so much respect, Vlad, in, in a real way, just to be as solid as I can with you and everybody watching this. I give so much respect. I don't go for no disrespect. You understand what I'm saying? I just don't. So that was one of those situations where you know, like Pimp C said it, said it at best, you know, niggas like to talk a lot of shit in a safe place. We're in a grocery store. And you know, I had to more or less keep my old lady from popping the nigga in the grocery store versus me, you know. I'm telling her, <laughs> it, don't worry about this shit, you know. But you know, she one of them individuals where, you know, she wanted to get active with him right then and there, just off of the aura of what the bullshit brought. And we kind of know what he was looking for because what you see is from a different angle from where it was. This motherfucker was a few feet up a long, far away with that camera zoomed in, saying and doing what he was saying, which was a cow and, and, and a bird move, if you ask me, you know. It, it just was one of those things where people are gonna look for clout and they're looking for clout and he seen an opportunity to try to get some clout and that's what that's what he got. Now, is it the right kind of clout that you want in regards to dealing with an individual like myself? I would say no, just to be honest with you. You know, because I can forgive, I just don't forget. That's just the way I am. So uh, stand on it. That's it. Well, uh, in December, you were driving your uh, Ford F-150. Uh, you get pulled over. Uh, the cop said that he smelled marijuana in the car. I think you actually handed him a joint <laughs> that you were smoking on, and uh, and they found a little bit more weed. But then when they ran uh, when they ran your ID, uh, I guess you had owed some child support, and there was a child abandonment charge. So you ended up getting locked up over Christmas. Yeah, I locked. I was locked up over Christmas. Uh, and it's it, the child abandonment was just some bullshit. It was one of them situations, honestly, where, uh, you know, I've owed a little piece of change or what or what not at that time in regards to my child support. Um, I had no idea the child support had even got filed on me five years ago in that situation. Uh, the mother maintained having a solid enough relationship with me, but at the same time was doing this shit behind my back. And I remained doing everything every father would do in regards to taking care of his child. But from a child support parent perspective, it doesn't reflect that because I was directly taking care of my child, unaware of a fucking child support. 
because I never was technically served. You know, they never served me and she was able to get an order put in place at that time because I never showed up to court. I never knowed about it. So they based my child support off of my highest income years, which made this child get this lump sum of her money and it accumulated over the years and became a, a pretty big debt at this point. So it's one of them situations where, you know, I had to go and face that and uh, got locked up here and had to be shipped back to Atlanta, done a little time in Atlanta. And uh, the judge heard me out. I ended up having to file bankruptcy into that situation, to be honest with you. And um, I was released from it and clearing it up now, you know, just to be solid as I can with you, you know. It's one of them situations where 150 implemented uh, all these cease and desists on my music. I own my catalog, so it stopped all my income in a sense. So therefore, any music or any money I was making from my catalog, which everybody knows about the tens that I was dropping in, everybody knows I'm a force to reckon with when it comes to this music. So you end up filing for bankruptcy again, uh, which is now the second time. Right. And now and now, now you're going, going through that as well. Yeah, it's one of those situ situations where, you know, I was left to actually put in a position where I had damn near no choice because I have him cease and desist in all my music and then laying the claim to the world as if I owe him some amount of money when technically 50 knows very well how much I'm owed in regards to the music and in regards to him in itself and what the company or whatever owes me. So he, like I say, he's good in strategically manipulating the mind of the public to feel a certain way by his post and the things that he does. And I just done learned how to deal with not only him, but the situation. Sometimes you just gotta let go and let God just to be as solid as I can with you, Vlad. Because I know one thing that goes with karma, it doesn't skip over nobody. So I try to put the same energy and be as factual and real as I can with, with everybody. Because when you feel comfortable knowing that you have fucked over somebody or blind or stole or whatever the case, and you feel like you're comfortable with going in front of these people and can sit in there. I, I see some of the radio interviews and he has this sarcastic ways of, 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 of talking and, and, and speaking down on the crew of G unit and, you know, how he's done this and that, but you would never hear him become truthful and say what it really truly is. For me, I've learned that karma tends to sharpen a knife when the person feels like they've beat, beat it. He just hasn't been poked yet. I've been poked with a lot of my karma and I've learned from it. So I've learned to be able to say, you know what, let me put out the same energy that I want in, in return. And that's, good positive energy. So I, you know, I've had my negative moments where I jump in. Of course, I'm a man first before anything and I'm never gonna let no motherfucker disrespect me in no kind of way it, 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 where I can actually stand and st stand for who the fuck I am. So, you know, of course I've bit back and said things and that's just being the man in me, period. Like you're not gonna do that. But overall, man, I ain't got number positive vibes, man, when it's all said and done. Because I know one thing about this game, man. You know, you 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 get you get what you give. You know what I'm saying? And it's like I rather give this positive vibe and this positive energy because I didn't really get a lot from giving the negative vibes and negative energy out of this shit. So it's almost like a 360 for me. And uh, I don't wish bad on nobody, but I know one thing. You know what I'm saying? You got to you got to. Uh, you got to uh, answer to to your own karma at some point in time. Well, uh, in October of this year, you were in the news once again. Uh, I guess there was some sort of incident at home with your girlfriend, and she ended up shooting at you. And both of you got arrested. 
Well, it's only so much that I can say about this situation. Technically, I'm going to be honest. Look, I got an ankle monitor on my fucking ankle right here. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it's crazy. Yeah. I'm going to say this much to you, Vlad. She didn't even shoot that fucking gun at me at all. It was captured oh. on a fucking camera from a perspective of her looking like she shot the gun at me. But that was because some neighbors was in the window taking a fucking picture of her pointing the fucking gun and me getting the fuck up out of there, out of the situation, all right? It's the actual things that follows behind the case that is amazing. And it's that technically, quote unquote, I'm the victim in that situation. I didn't put my fucking hands on, on a, in no kind of way. I broke a couple things in the home that I paid for. You know, I became a little bit irate out of the shit. But when I get, you know, through the situation, I find myself being charged with her guns. They're trying to charge me right now for unlawful possession, saying that I lived in the home because they found a piece of mail with my name on it. I haven't lived in that home with damn near, probably damn near over a year. I was there. I didn't live there. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm dealing with the things of where I was given a $60,000 bond, all right? $60,000 bond on this case. During the time of giving the bond, I make a fucking couple phone calls from in jail to her to try to get a hold of somebody else's number, pulled down out of my cell and charts for violating a no contact order. And she never even picked the fucking phone up. They added 20 more thousand to the bond, 80,000. I get out on an $80,000 bond. They put an ankle monitor on my motherfucking leg and have me taking piss tests every week. Every fucking week, all right? Now, mind you, this gun belongs to this lady. It was in her home. The home is in her name. She's registered to carry. I didn't know two goddamn things about the gun. Don't know, didn't know if she had the guns, where she kept the guns, or none of that shit. But this is the situation that I'm dealing with you know, in a, in, a, in a social injustice area out here where the case was given, it's been multiple guys that's been treated wrong out of these situations like this. You know, I just been dealt a bad situation and through the grace of God, all of this gets thrown out. And, uh, you know, I'm able to come back and do another interview and, and elaborate a little more about the situation with you on the next go round. But it's kind of crazy, bro. Uh, like I say, uh, What's going on? I'm, I'm, I'm sure if it gets too crazy, you know, in my situation at this point of time, you know, they're, they're, they're having a lot of eyes pay attention to that court at this point uh, in regards of how uh, it's a malicious prosecution type of situation involved with myself. So I'm sure the NAACP is paying close attention to them right now, as well as the whole world, because it's very clearly that 50% of my situation is based on who I am and the other one is strictly racism. I'm in a place where, you know, it is very, very racial driven, I think in my case as well. But uh, I just want to say that much. I know I got somebody beside me like, yo, yeah, but I had to get that off, you yeah. know? No, I understand. It's an open case, so we're not gonna go into any details or anything else like Word. that. Okay, well, man, look, such a such a roller coaster career and life uh, that you've laid out. Uh, my final question is: Do you ever envision, at some point in the future, an actual G Unit reunion with Game, you, Lloyd Banks, Tony Ayo, Fifty Cent, actually getting back together, going on tour together? whatever, at some point in the future. Do you ever see that happening? You know, I'm at a point now, man, where I'm just focused on moving forward with my career, with my artists. I got a hell of a team. I got a hell of an artist, uh, a group of artists at this point that's making a lot of noise right now. You know, I've wrote records for 50. You know, I've I, well, he's recited my lyrics word for word, man. You know, I've I've played my part with G-Unit 
in every kind of way as a lawyer, soldier, lawyer, brother, and everything. You know, at this point, I don't think nothing could get or move forward with myself unless, you know, I'm kind of, you know, paid attention to on what's really old or what's really the business is in my situation. If we could get past that, then I probably would consider it. But I see a lot of different pushes from uh, games manager and shit in regards to trying to make the versus thing happen and shit like that. And, you know, I support all of that type of shit like that, you know, in regards to them. But, you know, my shit is a little bit deeper than than any of this because, you know, I'm dealing with somebody that's, that's, that's worked tireless trying to end my career, should I quote unquote say. or And it's just a different feel when you see somebody go as hard as he's went in regards to me. So I really can't really just see myself being a part of G-Unit or being involved with G-Unit at this point in, in no kind of way. But Hey, God got it. I didn't see myself being involved with him back then and it ended up happening. God has his ways in doing things and, you know, I'm going to stay on God's on God's time more than anything. So I'll just leave it on a note of saying, you know, anything's possible. But right now, I'm, I'm not considering it uh, at all. Well, there you have it. Uh, right. Young Buck, man, I appreciate you spending the time. Like I said, me and you go back 15 years. We do. And, uh, you know, I know you're going through some tough patches right now. Yeah, but man. You still have fans. You still have a catalog. Uh, you still have people that love you. You got kids. Uh, and, man, listen, just take it one step at a time and keep doing your thing, and, and things will eventually work out. I got to, man. You know. God gives his touch, toughest battles to his toughest soldiers, bro. I'm all right. Yep. I'm all right regardless. You know what I'm saying? Throughout all of the bullshit talk and everything that they say, hey, man, I'm still sitting here doing doing all right. So uh, I can't complain about nothing I've been through in the past. The things you go through in life make, make you who you are. I got a lot of uh, real individuals that mean a lot to me. Just kept me on this path. So shout out to Big U. Shout out to Hollywood, baby. You understand? And uh, shout out to DJ Paul. You know, these are guys. Shout out to Labusi. You know, individuals that never changed or never gave me no different type of sideways. Shout out to Drummer Boy. We got a big ass tape that's on its way. We're back on my buck shit, volume three. That's about to be one of those, you know, moments where you get to really hear Buck in, 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 in raw form. So. You know, my career is here and, and I got a lot more to go. Uh, shout out to Netflix, you know, with the whole life life story documentary that's in the making right now. So it's one of those things where, you know, my life is a real movie and people are starting to come in tune with me as an artist. So throughout all of this shit, I'm realizing that it's bringing me full circle with the platforms that I need to be on and yours as well. So shout out to Vlad. Like I say, we got 15 years in and I've watched you grow from, you know, being the one that totally independent, you know, from behind the camera editing this shit to being on the platform that you have now. So I know hard work pays off if you a fucking perfect example. And uh, I'm gonna continue to keep on mashing. The only thing could ever take me away from here and doing this is is, is, is is death at this point. You know what I'm saying? And uh, rest in peace to all the fallen soldiers that we done lost in this game recently. Uh, and free all the real ones, man. I see a lot of these dudes is, you know, going through tough times as well. And I'm able to look at other people's situation and say, well, damn, I got it bad, but homie going through it a little bit rougher. So, you know, I'm at a place now where, um, you know, I'm just looking for the, uh, the opportunities to continue moving and making music. So more than anything, I'm looking to get my situations handled from a business standpoint, more than anything, say with a G unit to be able to move forward and uh, continue giving the world this great music that I can give them, you know? And that's how we're gonna end it. Young 100. Buck, man, truly a pleasure. Wish you all the best. It's Until all next love. time. Peace. <laughs>